All right, we'll call the select board meeting to order for Wednesday, April 6, 2022. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. In attendance from the select board is David Phil, Jane Nevin Smith, Joyce Chunglo, and John Muskevitz. Amy will hopefully be joining us just a bit later. And um, all votes will be taken via roll call. So first order of business is the consent agenda. We have warrants PR2219, AP2238, AP2238S, AP2237S, AP2238-2, AP2237, AP2239S, AP2239, AP2240, and AP2240S. We have minutes from April 28th, 2021, May 5th, 2021, May 19th, 2021. We have a DPW retire retirement for Dennis Pipchinski, which I'll pull that out. Uh, special conditions for FY21 Town of Hadley CDF grant, select board will approve. Hadley Police Department Special Police Officer Appointment, Harry Santiago. Hadley Police Department Traffic Control Officer Appointments, Walter Bush, Stephen Superba, Evan Golan. Hadley Police Department Dispatch Resignation for Melissa Sichka and Use of the Commons Easter Sunrise Service for the First Congregational Church, April 17th, 2022. And a common victualler uh, license for Mountain Farm Chicken LLC Popeyes. So moved. Yeah. Motion. Second. Uh, Motion. Is uh, Chief going to elaborate a little on his new help? Chief, did you want me to pull out any of those? Hey, it's completely up to you. I can explain whichever ones, all of them, or none of them. If you, it's totally up to the board. John, do you do you want him to elaborate, or is you good? Well, no. I mean, you're just replacing what it has left, just so everybody knows what's going on as usual. Yes, sir. Um, actually, that special police officer was one of the full-time officers who left, and he uh, wants to come back. Uh, we'll take him in whatever capacity we can get him. Okay. So I've got a motion by Jane, and it was a second by John. And any other discussion on consent agenda? No, but somebody muted me. Stop it. Not me. <laughs> it wasn't me, I promise. <laughs> I know you want to shut me off tonight, but really. <laughs> are, you, are you good, uh, Joyce? You ready to vote? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Yes. Muscavitz. Yes, except for Dennis Pipchinski, DPW. Okay. I'm okay, thank you. From that one. Okay. Um, and also, Gilbert is here from Popeyes, if y'all had any questions for him. Were we gonna, well, wait a minute. Were we going to talk about Dennis Pipchinski or who's going to talk about that? Yep. No, we'll, we'll do that. But uh, Gilbert, uh, I'll give you a chance real quick to uh, welcome to town. Did you want to say anything about uh, the new Popeye's restaurant before we move on? Yes, absolutely. We're very excited to be here. Uh, this is our first Popeye in the area and uh, we're very excited to be here. We love the area and we're looking forward to be a part of the community. When do you well, think? Welcome. You're welcome. Um, when do you I'm sorry. When do you plan to open? Uh, we are currently hiring uh, employees, and uh, it's 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 a little bit tough getting people. So, uh, as soon as we get some uh, some employees here, uh, we will uh, we will shoot to open hopefully in the next two weeks. Is that your background in the restaurant right now that we're seeing? Correct. Yeah, I'm at the Popeyes right now. Yes. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, welcome and uh, good luck. Thank yep. you so much. Absolutely. Welcome to Hadley. Thank you so much. We're very excited to be here. All right. Thanks. Have a good night. All right. So um, I pulled out Dennis Pipchinski. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to Dennis for, I'm not sure exactly how many years, I imagine 30 plus. I'm, John, you probably know how long he's been yeah. here. So quite a long time. And uh, he is retiring as our uh, chief operator for the wastewater plant in town. So I just wanted to say thank you for all that. What's, his, what's the date of his retirement? We didn't see that. Um, John, you know with that offhand? I think it's in a couple of weeks, so. Okay. I, I believe it's April 19th. Ah, uh, Deb knows. There we go. Thank you, Deb. All right. So good uh -oh. wishes to Dennis, and thank him. Thank you, Dennis, for all that you have done um, 
for keeping track of all of our water and sewer lines and um, your wealth of knowledge uh, on all of these projects. So thank you for your service. And so we just need a motion to approve that retirement. So moved. Second. And motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on that? Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Trungalo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Uh, yeah. Abstain. Oh, that's right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll move on to public comments. Uh, we'll limit this to 15 minutes. Please keep your comments to three minutes or less so that everyone has a chance to speak. Were we um, going to hear from Mike Mason? Nope. I think he's. he said he was good. Okay. Is that correct, Chief? Yeah, I'm, I'm all set with that, but I can, uh, there's a couple other issues I, uh, Carolyn may want me to hang out for, so we'll still okay. be. Thank you, sir. A anybody that's here for public comments, uh, turn your camera on, wave at us, or raise the uh, digital Zoom hand there. Uh, I don't see anybody. All right, last call for public comments. Okay, uh, we'll move on. I see Amy is Amy has joined us for the record here. Hello. Hey, Amy. Hey, Amy. Welcome. So next on the agenda, we have an appointment for uh, 4.1 uh, Route 9 widening. Justin Roy from Baltazar Contractors, the project manager for Route 9, and he will discuss the staging area set up on Mill Valley Road. So is uh, Justin here? Yes, Justin Roy, I see you up there. Go ahead, sir. Tell us what you're trying to do. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. So the reason I'm here is we're looking at we're, we're doing the construction project, obviously, for uh, Mass DOT and, and Hadley on Route 9, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Uh, and one of the things that we're looking for is a staging area where we can uh, put equipment and materials and construction vehicles uh, in order to build the job. So one of the areas that we found uh, would be suitable and we're in a, an agreement with the property owner is over on uh, Mill Valley Road. Um, and that's why I'm here today is to share that information with everybody and, and hopefully I can get approval to utilize that area for this construction project. So I know um, one of the concerns was truck traffic coming, um, I guess it would be north on, um, on Mill Valley Road. I guess, I don't know, actually that would be West on Mill Valley Road. Um, I've heard that trucks would generally go toward the opposite direction towards South Maple Street and then go out to the light. Are, are you gonna, you know, the other intersection is pretty dangerous there at that angle. Is that is that the plan or? Yeah, I think I've, I've experienced that personally these past couple of weeks, just driving around the job, trying to, if you're leaving Mill Valley, getting onto Route 9, uh, that angle, that intersection is just not conducive to properly taking a left out of that, that intersection. Um, so I think uh, it's going to be in our best interest if we go around and use South Maple and use the signalized intersection. It's just going to be quicker and safer for our vehicles. So um, we're going we're gonna to limit our trucks to do that, to go out that direction. And that's one of the parts of our construction project is, is we're going to reconfigure that intersection at uh, Mill Valley and Route 9, they're going to make it more of a conventional T intersection, which I think is going to be better in the long run. Okay. And I got a couple of comments from the residents. You know, there's not a ton of houses down there on that end of the street, but there are a few. Um, are you able to put some kind of signage, you know, no construction traffic or something along those lines to encourage people to go down to South Maple versus going by the houses through the residential area there? Yeah, we could, we could absolutely put some signage up. Um, I think the big part will be just communication with our internal people. Um, okay. I think you're going to get occasional, uh, you know, delivery vehicles uh, or third parties, even the people that aren't affiliated with us um, that are going to get down that road. But I think a majority of the traffic we can direct the other, other way. Yeah. I mean, I, I doubt you'll be able to take hundred percent of it out of there, but if we can get most of it going the other way, that'd be great. 
Yeah, I agree. And uh, and people are going to find their way to just the general public and construction. When, when construction's going on Route 9, people are going to be traveling all over uh, trying to avoid construction. <laughs> right, right. John, you had something? Yeah. Hey, Justin, uh, would it be feasible to ask the state to extend the construction zone from uh, Route 9 to the intersection of Mill Valley and South Maple Street? To help you guys and and the public with the with the speed zones and stuff like that, I don't know. Maybe Mike would have something to say about that also. The police chief. Uh, that would that would keep it uh, a work zone and keep the uh, speeds down on Mill Valley also. So. Is what do you mean as far as extend the construction zone, like like uh, move the con the advanced construction signs to warn the. To warn the yeah, people. You, know, you got into construction there at the end of, of uh, Mill Valley right now, off the intersection of Route 9. But if we left Mill Valley as a construction zone, as a work zone, for the period of time that you'll be there, we could keep the speeds down there because people do fly up and down there. We got a pump station there that we go to practically every day. And, the normal traffic is, is pretty terrible down through that section. They're pretty fast. So I don't know if it's something that we could uh, ask the state to do or you could ask the state to do. But. Yeah, I mean, I think we could definitely put in uh, like signs before and after the construction entrance, uh, you know, like trucks entering or, uh, you know, caution trucks entering. Um, we've done that before in staging areas just to warn uh, to warn people that there's going to be construction vehicles going in and out. Um, that's something we could do. And this has already gone in front of the planning board, right? And they're all set with that. Correct. Yeah. We met with the planning board, I believe two or three weeks ago and um, they couldn't approve it, but they had no objections. And then they referred me to the select board. Okay. And then uh, chief Mason, do you have anything that you want to mention about this? Or are you okay with no, no, I think the suggestions about the signage that you made are good. And John's suggest John's uh, 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 statement about the speeds on that road are absolutely accurate. So anything that we can do to kind of slow folks down, the signage would be much appreciated from our end. I don't know who controls the speed limit sign, um, but we, we'd be happy to put up like an advisory speed limit sign on that street. Um, you know, like not a, conventional yellow black and yellow uh, i'm sorry black and white speed sign we can do like a yellow and black speed sign uh, we've put those up before if the police recommends a speed limit that they want to is it justin does it have to match the speed there or are you actually are you legally allowed to reduce it for the construction zone i guess i'd have to defer to you um i think if you put a yellow one it's, a, it's an advisory sign so it's just a recommend a recommendation for a speed limit uh okay. I, I believe it's not enforceable all right. Um, yeah, I mean, I would I would be OK with that. And I'll we'll make sure that the officers know that they couldn't cite people for that speed. But even if it slows half the traffic down to that speed, uh, I think that would be a good thing. I, I, I'm, I'm going to make a motion for us to accept the site plan approval for them to uh, have their construction site on Mill Valley Road. Yeah, I'll second it. All right. Motion by Joyce, second by John. Any other discussion on this? Uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote. Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Chungalo? Yes. Muscovitz? Yes. And Parsons? Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. <laughs> living on that street isn't it amy um well i'm just thinking a lot about farm machinery and the fact there's a business on the corner of mill valley and and uh south maple so but at least it'll be this. at this end of it which hopefully will not affect the side of the mill valley because they're not going to be going over that way so a lot of farm machinery moving on that side of the road Hey, yeah, Justin, can you get a hold of the police chief and uh, get together with them on what, what you want to do with that speed on, on that Mill Valley? Yep. What is the speed Absolutely. There? No, anyway, Mike. Is that John? What is hey, the sounds speed good. Mill now, 35? Yeah, I think it's 35. I'd have to double check it, but um, 
you know. We're usually going double that anyway. Hey, Chief, I know it's uh, it's 45 there. I've been talking to Mitch about that. I'm not sure if you're aware. We've been talking about that section of the road, but it, it is uh, 45. That's fast. 45. Yeah. I don't think that's 45. There was, I don't see a sign there that's 45. Yeah, it's, it's 45 there, and on the other side, it's 40. Yeah, it's, uh, that's the not side. a good place to have it, 45 for sure. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Well, um, I know that the state was uh, was working on passing a law that uh, would allow the select boards of communities to drop a uh, add or um, add or drop a speed limit by I think five miles an hour based upon what it was right then. You know, uh, just on a simple vote, changing a speed limit yeah, larger than that takes a little bit more work. But if Justin thinks that. Um, Mass DOT would have the ability to put up one of those advisory signs. And if we work with them, just make sure that the officers know they can't cite for that speed and just encourage people to slow down. Uh, I think, you know, for the purposes of what we're trying to do here, I think that would work. For the time being. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Justin, thanks for uh, coming tonight and let's get that project done and over with. <laughs> All right. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Good. Um, okay, 4.2, Econo Lodge Redevelopment, Valley Community Development. Laura Baker from Valley Community Development will present a potential redevelopment of the Econo Lodge on Russell Street. Is, can, I, uh, uh, can I ask a question before we have the yeah. presentation? Um, does this not have to be approved by the planning board and not the selectmen? So I think it does have to be approved by the planning board, but I think this is just an informational session. Yep. Okay. So yeah. I don't think correct. And we don't need to do any approval that you have to actually have the approval from the planning board. Correct. Yes. There, yep. Laura, okay. shake your hand. So, yeah. All right. I just wanted to clarify that for people um, listening to your presentation. Yeah. Planning board or ZBA, depending on the zoning uh, path that we follow, this is um, kind of a, an opportunity to just make sure folks in at your level know kind of what's coming and what we're thinking about. Um, my name is Laura Baker. I'm the real estate uh, development director from Valley CDC. And joining me tonight is Alexis Breitniker. Do you want to say hi, Alexis? Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm the executive director of Valley Community Development. So hi. I, I apologize to those who've seen this basic spiel before, but I have a five minute run through of what we're thinking. Uh, happy to take questions. And then we had a few specific questions um, that you might actually have some authority over. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Are folks seeing this? Mm -hmm. Good. All right. Great. So um, this is just basically showing you the location. I'm sure everyone on this call knows where this uh, property is located. Um, this is the intention is to create a total of 51 apartments, 50 for tenants and one for a live-in resident manager. Um, to do this by combining 24 existing hotel rooms to create 12 one-bedroom apartments, and then to convert 39 existing rooms to 39 studio apartments by adding kitchens to those units. Um, we'd like to convert the common areas to a learning center uh, with a group classroom and individual learning rooms. Um, and we're excited about the potential to add solar both to the hotel and to the uh, storage facility behind the hotel. Um, the residential uses are such that it would decrease the overall density uh, at the hotel. The hotel currently has 63 uh, individual rooms, uh, taking that down to 51 apartments. Uh, these would be primarily house single adult tenants, and some would have two-person households. Uh, 25 would be reserved for folks who are very low income, who uh, would need a rental subsidy, who would pay a portion of their income, and then the rest of their rent would be paid through a rental subsidy. Um, it would include a preference for people who don't currently have housing. And then 25 apartments for more middle income tenants who would also pay below market rent. Uh, and then the resident manager unit would be basically a trade, no income cap on that particular unit. Just so folks have an idea of what kind of income levels we're talking about, um, these are shown here. 
uh, we're, we're looking at a range from below 17,670 to a kind of cap of 40,380. We find that the 30% tier is suitable. We have retirees, we have part-time workers and persons with disabilities who tend to be renting at that level. And then the 60% units um, we find to be suitable for full-time low-wage workers. So someone who's working at minimum wage would easily kind of fit into this um, rental uh, situation. Um, one of the things we like about the O'Connell Ledge location is the fact that there are so many low-wage workers living, I'm sorry, working right in that area who may in fact be priced out of the kind of Hadley, Amherst, Northampton rental market. Um, we would have some on-site staff, uh, the live-in resident manager. We have a full-time resident service coordinator to assist tenants, full-time property manager, part-time maintenance staff, on-call overnight, and then a, a consultant to help us with IT. Um, basically, this is a life skills uh, learning model. People are living in a place where there are supports. So the focuses of this learning model are physical and mental health, educational and vocational advancement, economic stability, socialization and building positive relations, relationships and peer support. So we'd have a lot of subcategories within these big categories, but I'm trying to give you the kind of high level, high level look here tonight. Um, so I'm gonna stop and see if there are questions that you have about the basic premise. And then I have two items that I'm hoping we can touch on. One is a zoning question. We've already uh, spoken with the planning board. Um, we're looking at two potential zoning paths. One is called 40A, and it would be zoned through the planning board. And one is called 40B, which is specific to the creation of affordable housing. And it would be gorgeous. Um, and I think, correct me if I'm trying to figure out collectively what's the best path. Um, and I had sent a memo to the planning board. Um, and I think the planning board is interested in sharing that with town council for their opinion. And we, Valley, have offered to, to pay the cost of that consultation. Um, and then I'd like to talk for a moment about environmental review. Um, but I think I'm going to take us off the share screen so that I can see people. Hi. I have a question for you. Sure. Um, so are you purchasing the property? Yes. Okay. And is this um, primarily for disabled in any way people or just anyone at all? Or yeah. Yes. So, so <laughs> it's both. So no, it, I mean, I mean, that's okay. I mean, yeah. I'm just looking at the total picture um, sure. because certainly we want people of all kinds to be able to be uh, work sufficient and be out in the community and yep. these are the things and that's basically what your yep. um, project is about. Sure one of the, the certainly one of the impetuses of this is trying to make create more housing for people who are currently homeless. Mm -hmm. At Valley we uh, we've owned and operated housing like that for about 30 years. We don't um, we like a mixed income model. We don't think it's a great model to kind of just concentrate and segregate everybody who has super high needs in one place. Mm -hmm. So we want to create a mixed environment. So the 30% the units, which about half of the units would, would have a preference for people who don't have stable housing, which is actually a pretty wide definition. It includes someone coming from domestic abuse. It includes someone who's, you know, mm -hmm. place doesn't meet state sanitary code, whatever. It's a, it's a broader definition, I think, than most people understand. Mm -hmm. Then the other half is simply an income-based standard. So if you are below a certain income level and you have, you know, we do a screening um, and, and you meet those screening criteria, you can live there. And, and really the target for that is folks, I think that are working um, in Hadley. Mm -hmm. um, because there's, as Gilbert was saying, it's been really hard to get employees and it's, it's not only because there isn't affordable housing, but that's a piece of, of, the, of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Do they have to show income um, to qualify? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. How does um, this affect the tax rolls? That's sure. the I'm getting. So, because sure. you're a nonprofit, right, versus a hotel that's a for profit business. Correct. So if you haven't seen it already, I'm going to ask maybe um, 
Jennifer to recirculate, we sent her out a two page kind of question and answer memo about this project to the board. And I didn't repeat what was in that, but one of the obvious questions is about taxes. So yes, we would pay taxes um, according to the assessed value of the property. Okay. Other questions? Yeah, I, I do have one more. At any yeah. point, at any point, if that pro property gets defaulted on, does, yeah. does, would that property defer back to the town or would that just be an investment property that would go bankrupt? Yeah. So because we work with so much public money, um, all of the people who give us money usually do it in the form of a, a deferred mortgage. So what would most likely happen if we went into foreclosure is someone at the State Department of Housing and Community Development would kind of intervene um, and find another nonprofit owner for the property. So typically there is a long-term deed restriction um, on these properties. So it doesn't really have value to someone else. The deed restriction stays with the property. Um, so it really is in perpetuity, it's gonna be affordable housing. So when I have seen this happen, it's not happened to us, but when I've seen it happen, um, the state steps in, they don't wanna lose the, the housing stock um, and they'll find another <clears throat> sponsor to run it and operate it as affordable housing. Um, I can't really imagine a scenario where it would come to the town. Um, long before you took it for tax title, again, I think the state would intervene in a situation like that. Well, yeah, I mean, we got a, we got a similar situation at uh, Golden Court right now, another uh, elderly retreat, you might say, and uh, the town of Amherst uh, is actually running it now for the state. So I don't know what, what kind of complications or what other issues that, that yeah. would come down the road that we would be looking at. Yeah. I don't know anything about that situation. Is it the town of the Amherst or the Amherst Housing Authority that's um, housing Amherst Authority? I, I think it's Amherst Housing Authority. That's right. Uh, Bill's got his hand up. Well, we're going to get a little insight on it, hopefully. Well, not so much about the housing authority, but um, either of the paths that um, are being considered to convert this to affordable housing can only be uh, can only be used for affordable housing. If in some bizarre situation, CDC was to default, a third party commercial apartment owner could not come in and take over the property. E even if there weren't deed restrictions, it's not zoned for residential use in the industrial district. So um, really this is the only way it can proceed. I was hoping planning board was here tonight. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> yeah, and I think there's a difference between a housing authority being tasked with taking care of a troubled property and, and a, a municipality itself. Um, but again, I think that the message is someone else who's qualified, <clears throat> hopefully would intervene, be tasked with continuing to operate it as affordable housing. Where else do you have any of these facilities and where are they located? Yeah. So um, we own uh, rental housing in, uh, most of it's in Northampton. Uh, we built one property in East Hampton. We own and operate 11 units in Amherst and we're under construction on what's called the East Gables, right on Northampton Road um, in Amherst. It just broke ground and that'll be 28 units that are kind of similar to this. They're, they're where, small where is it in? Where is it in Northampton? So this the one I'm mentioning is in, is is that's right in Amherst, just being built. Right. Um, in Northampton, we have property on King Street. We have two buildings in the center of Florence. Uh, we have several buildings downtown. It's it's scattered around. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't own any other hotels, so the concept of converting hotels to this kind of affordable housing is relatively new. It's been done nationally. We're not the first in Massachusetts to do it. The state's very interested in it because it's a faster path to creating affordable housing than when we start from scratch. Mm -hmm. I have okay. a couple of questions actually. Um, so I used to live in Minnesota, which is a, a huge welfare state. Um, and I saw things that were called affordable housing or income-based housing. And what happened is they took such a percentage of the people's income 
that they were still unable to live. And yeah. so what concerns me is when you want to say like affordable housing or income-based housing, yeah. are you taking too much away from them so that they can never get out from under themselves? Yeah. And I, I mean, Minnesota, like I said, is a huge welfare state. A lot of yeah. people I knew, a lot of people personally on welfare. I had friends on welfare. And then I had coworkers whose you know daughter was, again, a domestic violence person. Yeah. Um and she went into a place and they took so much of her income that she couldn't yeah. afford to take care of her children. A huge concern to me, you know, because I know a lot of people personally in those situations, yeah. um, that when it, when you talk about income base, like, what does that actually mean? Sure. It's a great question. <laughs> um, so half of these units, as I mentioned, um, we would try to get rental based subsidies and a rental based subsidy means that the rent is not fixed. It, it slides up and down with the tenant's income. It's really the best way to protect against what you're describing. So people are paying 30% of their income, regardless of what their income is, as long as their income is below a certain level. It leaves them with 70% of their income to, to buy other things, which could still be limited, you know, but it's trying to make it equitable. Um, the 60% units ha will have a fixed rent, but it will be a below market rent. So tip right now in this area for a studio, we're seeing rents about $737, including all utilities. And so that still could be expensive for someone, but there's nowhere else in the region that you can rent at that level. So it's significantly below the market rent. And so those tenants will have to show they have enough income to be able to pay rent. They'll be, have to be in what we call a window. We have enough to pay the rent, but you're not over income. Are students be going to be excluded from this? Yes. The funding that we use, uh, it, it's a yes and a no. Um, undergraduate full-time students are not eligible to, to live in a, a subsidized place like this. If you are an older person who's working part-time and taking classes, yes, you could live in a place like this. What we're trying to avoid is folks who are artificially low income because they're still being supported by their parents. Um, mm -hmm. They're not gonna be eligible, but we're pushing hard on education um, as sure. a part of this model, but it's for mm -hmm. adult learners. Okay, that's good, thank you. Sure. Any other questions for uh, Laura? No. Very informative, and I'm hoping people are watching so they can see what it's about. Sure. Thank you. And we have met with the Housing Committee, uh, Housing and Economic Development Committee, the Planning Board. Um, so we'll try to keep getting around to different groups to kind of make sure people have the information. Um, mm -hmm. There was an article in the paper, um, which was great, and we had positive responses to that. So that, that is also a nice thing. Um, so I wonder if the select board needs to or can weigh in on the issue of a consultation between the planning board and the town council so we can try to coordinate. We don't want to go in down a zoning path that doesn't, we want to coordinate with the town. We don't want to be at loggerheads with the town. So we want to go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I, I did speak with uh, Jeff Blake at uh, KP Law uh, yep. this afternoon and um, I've been working with Carolyn about getting okay. his reply. Great. Awesome. That's wonderful. Thank you very, very much. And again, we're happy to pay the price tag because it, it's the price of doing business. Um, and then the other question is actually for Carolyn, who I understand is the environmental certifying officer for the town of Hadley. Is that right? So all those uh, documents were given to me, directing me to be that person. So yes. I, I took on that role. I don't know if I was Hooray. the right person. But <laughs> yes. Someone has to sign this stuff. So yeah. um, the reason I bring it up is um, because we may be using some federal money down the road, we would like to do an environmental review similar to what you might do for, say, if you're using a CDBG program. And so I can connect with you, Carolyn. I will do everything. I will do all the work. It's really someone from town certifying it. And then it floats up to the state level or to HUD. In our case, it'll float up to the state level. So okay. I just want to- Such a deal that somebody else does all the work and we just have to all stamp the it. Work. 
<laughs> we need more of those deals. Because <laughs> I'm in a deal right now with a grant that they're not doing all the work. No, I know. I know. They come in all different shapes and sizes. Papers, forms everywhere, signatures here, and scan it there. So like, so thank you. <laughs> please feel free if you need to reach or want to reach me. I would love to hear from people in town. Um, Valley CDC has a website. Uh, it's valleycdc.org. You can see the other properties that we've developed on that website. If you're curious, you can drive mm -hmm. around and, and look at them. Um, and certainly I am always wanting to hear people's um, questions and comments. So anybody, yourselves or anybody else, just please refer them to me. Um, we want to have a good level of transparency and dialogue with, with the members. So basically the select board is waiting to hear from the planning board and the ZBA on their conclusion and approval um, before we actually move forward. And I don't even know if you need a, do you need a vote for the select board? It's just from the planning board and the ZBA, correct? Yeah, there will Great. be other points of time where I may come to you if we need like a letter of support, for example, some of, the, especially the state loves to see that from municipalities. And I don't presume that you have that level of support now, but I could come back at another time seeking something like that. But mm -hmm. the permitting is going to fall either to your planning or your zoning board. Thank you. Uh, hey, David, I got another question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I haven't, haven't been paying as much attention as I should to subcommittee. Uh, Bill and uh, Molly, is this something that you you were discussing in your committee meetings at some point? Or? Uh, yeah, John, thanks for asking. Um, at our last uh, Economic Development Committee meeting, Housing and Economic Development Committee meeting, um, Laura presented and uh, there was a unanimous vote in support of this project as presented um, based on the facts that we had in front of us. And we did ask if Laura would be looking for a letter of support from our committee. Um, and that was one of the things we just wanted to mention to the select board, obviously, we're a subcommittee, um, so we didn't want to do anything like that. But when you know we get to the point where um, you know if the select board is comfortable with the project as well, um, our subcommittee would like to offer uh, writing a letter of support in addition to whatever the select board might do. But we would you know want your permission at that time. All right, thanks. Uh, the uh, you know the other question I had and. Being at work, I do happen to monitor the police and fire calls. Mm -hmm. And they're getting a lot of calls to a lot of the motels as it is for some of the low-income people that are actually living there now. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd like a little input from the police chief and the fire chief on, on this subject also. So I think it is going to affect us, you know, a little bit, but... Probably not a lot. Yeah. Well, we probably want to have them back at another meeting to yeah. They talk to Laura, not yeah, yeah. No, that, that's fine. I just I, I'd like their input on it, also. You know. Well, we we have no vote on it, John. Uh, this yeah. goes before the planning board, the ZBA. Uh, yeah. If they if they go whichever way they go, um, that's what we're going to have. But we would like to work in conjunction with them with our fire and safety, just yeah. to make sure everything works well. But yeah. as a vote, we have nothing to say on it, except whether we support it or not. Yeah, we want your blessing. Yeah. So we want to be able to address any concerns that you have. That's how mm -hmm. we want to do business. So um, happy to schedule another time to come back and kind of dig down a little bit deeper, another layer down with questions. I think certainly keeping in touch with um, public safety is, is, a, is a good rule and making sure um, everything there is up to code when you're building and they're all yeah. a part of that anyway. So yeah. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that you know that having done other projects. So I, yeah. um, well, Hadley has this great tradition or meeting schedule with the, called the development team, I think. So we met, went and met with that group, which is building, fire, police, DPW, and that was super helpful for us. It's more the nuts and bolts of, of public safety mm -hmm. um, and code compliance. Um, Good. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, right. hopefully we'll have you back, uh, David. Yep. Anytime. Let us know. Okay. Um, yeah. Anytime you have time, I have time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, let Thank us know you. when you need more time and happy to have you come back. Yeah. And if you want to okay. do that with uh, both chiefs, you know, during a meeting yeah. or outside a meeting, you just, just let us know. So Very informative. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. All right. We're going to skip around a little bit here because we've got some people that need to get to other meetings. So we're going to go to the uh, Municipal Building Committee mm -hmm. uh, project update. I think Tim's here and I'm not sure. I thought I see, uh, saw Dan, Dan, Dan Regish is here too. So Tim, go ahead, take it away. Well, which building would you like us to start off with? Uh, Let's go the most controversial first. How's that sound? Nah. Nah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's, go, let's go good one because that's the most viable. Yeah. So uh, we are we finally have the uh, package uh, ready to go out for bid. Um, we're just waiting for the final set of mechanicals, which should be here shortly. Uh, so we'll be handing those over. That will be for phase one. And phase one is uh, essentially a lot of that is the electrical portion of that building. We're going to have to revamp everything. There's still a live knob and tube in there that's going to be taken out. Uh, the Even the panel is way too small, doesn't need code. We got all that all worked out. Uh, and also with, with this phase one work, will be upgrading enough to do phase two, which is the addition off the back for the elevator, new bath, accessible bathrooms and uh, stairs. So we also hope- lose a bathroom, hmm? a bathroom now for the first one. Yeah, and phase one will also have a temporary first floor bathroom that's accessible for the use of meetings uh, with the planning board and also park and rec. So we hope to get out, get the um, bids out and get something back. Um, I would hope by the end of June, first of July at the latest and get that work started right away. It should not take that long to get it all done with. And at the same time, we're also thinking about <laughs> We, we've held off on a little bit on phase two design work because with the way uh, everything is these days and flux with regard to pricing, we don't, we're pretty sure we're not going to be doing everything that we need to do or could do with phase one. So some of the minor stuff that we're talking, thinking about and we add it on for the second floor, we're probably not going to be able to do that. So when we get those bids back, then we can, what we ha won't be able to do, we'll throw into uh, phase two and get that out, hopefully sometime in, in um, mid to late fall for phase two design work and out to bid. So we're in good shape right now. So we'll be fast tracking things quickly now. So one of, one of the things before we go on to any other projects, as we talked about last night, and I just want to put that out there before we do talk about anything else, is that um, originally there was $50,000 in the budget for architect fees. Over an eight-year period, we have now depleted that account of the $50,000, and I think they used every penny to what it was worth to have Larry be our architect and uh, have gotten great response from him. Um, what we need to ask the select board tonight and the town is that we need to have a little bit more money put into that account for future projects that we feel that we need to have an architect um, being able to uh, give the plan, the building committee um, advice. Um, so that's one of the things I, I, I wanted to bring up before we go into the other buildings. Okay, Tim? Yeah, thank you for bringing yes. that up because that is very critical. We don't have any money to do any type of specs for any future um, projects that we have. And we have a few that we'd like to start, but we don't have any money to do that. And, and the, the hiccup thing 
of this year with regard to coming back to some pricing for, for Russell School. Since we don't have an ability to have a professional to give us some advice on that, we, we haven't been able to do anything. So we're kind of stuck on that. And we certainly do want to bring forward an article to get some more money sooner than later on that. Because uh, it unfortunately got depleted. Well, it took nine years to deplete. Yeah. We, it took us nine years to deplete, but um, yeah, it went quick. And the other issue with Goodwin is we've had to um, dip into the construction money because unfortunately the architectural fees that we had set aside were inadvertently um, disposed of at one of the um, uh, you know, go arounds that we had. We un we understood, we understand how that can happen. So, but we think that we're we're in pretty good shape um, to go forward with phase one. But we are out of money to do almost anything going ahead. But that's a um, good one in a nutshell. Do you want to add anything, Gary? Oh, I agree. That's it. Okay. Okay. What's what's next? The net we can. Uh, the columns. We the next big item was the painting of the columns uh, for the town hall. Uh, just a little bit of brief history. Unfortunately, when the package went out for bid, uh, not all the specs went with it, just the drawings. So the person that was awarded the bid was only a painter, and that's all he felt he was doing. So we we essentially put that project on hold because why paint if we don't have anything reconstructed and, and fixed uh, with those columns. Um, Mr. Tuttle, Larry Tuttle has tried unsuccessfully for over six months to get in touch with this gentleman through all means of communication, phone, emails, text, everything. There is absolutely no communication back from him. So we have, uh, Gary Burke has gone to Carolyn and asked, you know, I think it's about time that we, we look into what the town can actually do at this point, because here we are right before we can get into a painting season and we have yet to be able to talk to this guy. So it might be, we'd like to not get well, the, uh, the project. Other, the other part of this is we're ready to, we have the specs and ready to go out. We have the money. To go, we were going to go back out with the second bid for yes. the reconstruction part. This guy was going to keep on and stay on as a painting. Uh, so Larry's been trying to reach out with him saying, look, we're getting ready to move forward to the bid. Are you still going to do the painting and readjust the costs so yeah, that no, we man. can do this? Or do we go back out for the whole thing? If you're not going to do the painting part, we're going to send it out as a complete package again. So that's what we're kind of waiting for as to how to... Uh, if this guy, if this guy's not interested, then obviously he can bid on the whole thing again if he wants to. But we got to, we're ready to go out to bid one way or the other. Either we go out just for the reconstruction, or we put everything back together and take the reconstruction away from that. That's one project. So we're in a little bit of a dilemma. I think um, we need, uh, you know, maybe town council to be involved, trying to figure out how how to proceed. Maybe a letter to him a forceful letter to him stating, you know, we haven't had a response. So I'm sorry. We, we have to proceed where we have serious issues here. We can't just keep uh, waiting on this guy because uh, we're, we're very worried about those columns. Okay. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, Carolyn, do you want to get with Gary or uh, Tim this coming week and see if we can at least get a letter out to him or whatever we have to do to complete? comply with procurement and move on. Mm -hmm. So I have a question. If you're going out to bid, could you put the bid out so that you would have option A, which would be to repair the columns, and option B to paint if necessary, so that while you're working with the person who currently has a contract, you aren't held back because someone could bid on the contract to build and paint, as or repair and paint, as opposed to just repair. And then if you don't take the second part of their bid, is that legal to do? I don't know. We've gone through that round quite a bit. Um, 
a number of months ago to try to figure out how we could proceed with where we were. And that was told to us was not a good option to do at this point. It's either you put it out as a package of repair and with this guy painting, or if he agrees to rebid, put it out as a repair and paint project. But since we can't get a response back to him, we're kind of stuck. So let's let's have our lawyer, um, is what we talked about last night, at least get their uh, input into how we can proceed um, since we've had no response for several months from this person that was awarded the bid and has not responded to the town and what we need to do to null and avoid this uh, contract with him. So we can move forward with putting out another bid. Jennifer? The contract's expired. Oh. Work was supposed oh. to be completed. It's not been completed. The contract's expired. It has Perfect. been for quite, And it has been for quite a while. All right, that saves us attorney fees. He was given an extension, unfortunately. So he's still under the extension. Is there an extension, Jennifer? I am not aware, Carolyn, I apologize for jumping in, but I'm not aware of a contract extension. I don't have one in the procurement files. And the contract reads that, um, sorry, just let me open it back up. But something we should look into because we were under instruction and he's on an uh, The work shall be completed by November 30th, 2020. Right, but we changed the rules that he can't paint how we fix it and we went back out the bid. Well, you, you can't just change the rules without going with the contract. So if the contract is null and void, then that takes us out of the picture where we can go out to bid. So why don't we get together with Jennifer because she has all the documents in front of her and see what we need to do. If we don't need a lawyer and it makes it null and void, then we can go out to bid uh, and do what we need to do. So that would be great. Mm -hmm. Well, obviously it needs to be fixed before it needs to be painted. Right. So yes. An alternative, uh, alternate bid, or this guy can bid, bid on a repair. I, I don't know where you're at with all of He's that. out of there, John. This one's gone now. If that if he hasn't done the work, let's make sure that we don't need to use him because he's not responding. So 2020. 2020. So well, let's get together with Jennifer. Jennifer, I can come in within the next, the next couple of days and we can go over that. Okay. We'll do. All right. What's next, Tim? I know you're on a timeline here, so. Yeah, the, I guess the, the other one was the trailers now at the DPW. Um, we've been, uh, I guess now we are in the point of like remodeling a couple of the, the bigger trailers and replacing the brake trailer um, and possibly like some furniture and stuff. Uh, right now, the numbers that I've got coming in, you know, I think between, you know you can replace the trailer and probably fix up the other two. We should be under a hundred thousand now. Um, uh, you know, depending on what, it's hard to get pricing from stuff and, you know, like furniture and stuff. If you don't know what you're picking out and roofing and stuff like that, it's hard to hold a price, but I think a hundred should definitely give us enough leeway to take care of the items that need to be addressed. Well, that's good. Then we can use the ARPA funds for something else. So. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Um, we, we did talk about, um, a few other of the smaller projects. Um, and we did talk about Russell School, <laughs> a municipal building uh, committee is uh, reaching out to the select board, uh, thinking that it might be wise to have um, a large meeting with all the uh, departments or who wants to be involved and try to figure out where, what where we should go with this building. Uh, certainly nobody wants to wait another seven years to get rid of the building or do something with it. We're looking at astronomical pricing to uh, try to uh, renovate that building. And the other thing is that everybody keeps on bringing up. Even if we do renovate it, what are we gonna do with it? What's a, what's a, what are the uses? The uses are extremely limited. We can't just think of um, anything for them because um, 
uh, of the building code problems with seismic. But uh, the price tags are going through the roof right now. It's, it is, we're at a point that there are some serious problems with the building. I think it's getting to the point that, especially on the West Portico, is extremely unsafe. We need to start being realistic about this. I'd love to see the building saved, but you know we got to be realistic about the price tag on this. Tim, um, what was the last price tag? And I know that was from a while ago, but yeah, it was twenty-one million. Yeah, we don't have twenty-one million, and don't let me get started on another building because you know where I'm going. Yeah. Um, but you know we've talked about this. Uh, if we can tear it down, put up a replica, um, it's going to sink. I mean, that other side, and that was when we built the elementary school and the Greenfield architect at that time told us that that side of the building towards Hopkins Academy is going down. And every year it has sunk further and further. So even thinking about putting up a uh, elevator on that side is not even feasible. You know, so we really need to take a look at that as much as people want to do history and keep the building. It is the center of town, but we really be need to be realistic about this. So this really needs to be a good, good dis discussion between more boards than what we can do tonight. So I, I ask us to uh, at least set a date um, amongst us and see what we can come up with to have a good discussion between Historical Society um, Commission, um, the planning board, uh, someone from there, the select board, the municipal building committee, uh, the building commissioner, anybody that has an interest in that uh, building uh, to, to help us determine whether or not it needs to go, it needs to be replaced, or what we need to do. Because this is not just a, um, a, a determination made by five, five people on the select board. I think that meeting that Joyce is talking about would be well to be like a um, public forum with members of all those different boards at a speaker's table talking and then the audience having a participation piece. Whatever the select board wants. I, I think it needs to be a committee that, that we assemble first. And, you know, what, what, like Joyce mentioned, with members of the Historical uh, Commission and, and other important groups in town and let them hold the public forum since they, you know, they're the ones with knowledge here versus the select board that doesn't, I mean. We had, we had appointed a subcommittee, David. I, we haven't heard back from them yet. Yeah. That, that fell apart, unfortunately. And, you know, we yeah. looked into, into um, redevelopment opportunities. There really wasn't much interest. We looked into Grants. There really wasn't, you know, there was the twenty-five or fifty thousand dollar grants, but that doesn't do a whole lot with a twenty-one million dollar bill. So we really just need to uh, get a committee together to point us in the direction that we're going to go, and then stick with that direction, whatever it is. Because the longer we wait, the more expensive it's getting, and the fewer our options are getting. As when time that committee is formed, it's got to have a date and a very short date to try so, to come up with something because. We got some serious issues. So let's put and this on. We're very worried. Yeah. So let's put this on our next agenda of who we're going to appoint to that committee. And I see Denise is here. So I'm sure they'll want some reps from historical here and planning and whatever else. Let's talk about it next meeting. Cause we've got a ton on this meeting. And then, um, right. You know, if we want to solicit a couple members of the public, that's fine too. But, um, you know, let's let's do our usual. Put the notice out there and give people time to respond. Listen, I want a pro and a con. Yep. I don't want two pros. I don't want two cons. I want one nay, one yay. You know, so that we can have a good discussion. Yeah, I, I agree. You no, know, for keeping it because I still think there, with all the money floating around the federal government and the state government, that that thing could be funded through um, historical at some point it ain't going to happen tomorrow but if you went through and got some grants that building could probably be done with minimum town input of funds well it depends what we want to use the building for we haven't even determined that yet so we got another discussion 
Yep. We'll look at, we'll talk about this next meeting just because we've got a long meeting tonight and yep. we'll, we'll form that committee and get it underway. Okay. Sounds good. Those are the most important of the subjects that we talked about. We did talk about some very small um, projects ongoing, um, but uh, nothing that's uh, super urgent, I guess. Right, Joyce? Yes. Okay. We have our next meeting on the 10th? 10th, yes. We're going to have another meeting. 10th of May. May 10th. Yeah. Okay. Any Sounds questions? Good. No, thank you. I appreciate you coming. I know you've got Probably another anytime. another meeting. So okay. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Um Gilbert, if you're if you're done, you don't have to hang out tonight unless you really want to watch us talk about all kinds of stuff. No, no. I mean, I, if you have guys have any questions for me, I'm ready. If not, then then uh no, you know, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, you can you can head out unless you really just want to hang around to see what's going on. <laughs> I don't feel you have to hang out. <laughs> it's been a long day for me, trust me. Yeah, but no, no, I, no, I just we're very excited to be here. And honestly, if anybody has any questions, uh, I, I would love to uh, to respond to it. We uh, today we had the final. Uh, yesterday we had the final health inspection came in, and today the fire department came in also gave us our okay. So you know, uh, we're just looking forward to to start. That's all. If I could sing the little, if I could sing the little ditty to Popeyes, I would say you're all set. But I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we thank you so much, and uh, we hope to see you as customers uh, at the Popeyes. Well, thank sorry, you. Sorry to make okay. you hang out for an hour, but thanks for hanging that, out. No problem at all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right. Good Have luck. A great to day. You. Yep. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Uh, we'll move on to five point two, which is uh, climate change committee. Climate change committee will pro provide an update on the following upcoming projects and events: plastic bag ban, Hadley Spring Cleanup Day, Hadley Climate Day, and green community application. And I think Jack is here. I'm here, and Bruce Brewer is here. And Bruce will start by talking about the plastic bag ban. All right. <coughs> All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm here, I've been tasked by the Climate Change Committee to uh, present these bylaws, which bans the use of single plastic bags, uh, polyesterine, which is styrofoam, and disposable food containers and plastic straws. And I believe that uh, if, if the town uh, votes on these bylaws, it, it will be a small step, but a very sensible step uh, uh, that the town can take uh, that would have an impact, a positive impact on our environment. Uh, when we drafted these bylaws, we looked very closely at uh, the bylaws in East Hampton, Amherst, Northampton, and uh, Buckland. I tried, uh, we tried to look at some small towns similar to uh, Hadley, but as you know, Hadley is, uh, is extremely unique uh, based on our uh, size and our sort of economic um, composition. So um, if we pass these bylaws, uh, I mentioned this uh, uh, going back a couple months that we won't be alone. Uh, there's uh, 140 other communities in Massachusetts that have already passed bylaws uh, similar to the ones that we're proposing. Uh, there are some states that passed statewide bans and uh, even some countries in the world that passed uh, nationwide bans. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on uh, the argument for this other than um, that in the United States alone, uh, over 100 uh, billion plastic shopping bags are uh, produced every year and used. And to make those plastic bags, uh, 439 million gallons of oil <clears throat> is used to manufacture them. <clears throat> and um, only 5.2% of these bags are ever recycled. And it represents uh, a third of all that we find in our, um, in our um, sites across the country. And what makes uh, <clears throat> plastics uh, different from uh, other alternative bags, which would be uh, cotton tote bags, uh, brown paper bags, things of that nature, is that plastic bags are made out of plastic. And for them to degrade, uh, it takes 500 to 1,000 years. And when they do eventually break down, they form microplastics, which uh, has been written about uh, extensively um, in almost every publication in, in the country. Um, and those microplastics,
Essex Center, the, the uh, sort of the uh, food web. Uh, it's in our animals, uh, marine life, and uh, some studies that just came out recently uh, shows that microplastics are now being found in the bloodstreams of humans. Uh, so if we do pass these bylaws uh, at the Springtown meeting, it, it's a very small step, but it's a positive step and it's something that Hadley can do uh, in terms of uh, taking on a part that we can do that's uh, positive. So I just wanted to um, highlight a few things uh, in our bylaws. Um, I, I, it's my understanding that the, you know, the board has uh, read through them that you might have an issue or a concern about the uh, section at the end of the bylaws about penalties and enforcement. And we can talk about that in a minute. Um, but, uh, the scope of our bylaws are very similar to um, East Hampton, Northampton, and Amherst and Buckland. Um, uh, all the, all of these towns have uh, banned uh, in some form the use of single uh, plastic bags, styrofoam, and plastic straws, although it's my impression, and I'm not an expert in all these bylaws, uh, that Amherst uh, has not uh, ruled out plastic straws, but I might have misunderstood that. Um, uh, the definitions for all these plastics are uh, defined uh, by uh, national standards, so I won't go through all the definitions of these plastics. Uh, in terms of the checkout bag, which is the one that we're the most familiar with, um, all these towns in one way or another share the same um, kind of uh, definition of a checkout bag uh, that will be acceptable. And that, that is one that is uh, one that's reusable. And uh, one of the most important things is the best bag you could use is the one that you own already. So uh, whether it's a paper bag, uh, a tote bag that's made out of cotton or some kind of fabric or a heavier plastic bag, um, the best bag is the one that you have already. Um, and I know I was just uh, talking to Jack the other day and in each of our family's cases, we have uh, purchased uh, some tote bags uh, a number of uh, years back and we're still using the same bags year after year. So we know that they uh, can hold up. Um, so uh, the produce bag, which is the bag that you find inside uh, the grocery store when you uh, buy, uh, for example, produce, uh, those uh, produce bags uh, would have to be uh, compostable. Uh, and most of the stores have done that, like uh, Big Y, uh, for those who shop there are familiar with that. Um, the uh, brown paper bags, I think everybody's very familiar with. Uh, they just have to be uh, labeled. Uh, and by labeling, you, if you use a brown paper bag, uh, for example, at uh, Big Y or uh, Trader Joe's or any of those places, you'll find a... Uh, label on them that says that they're 100% recyclable and it's uh, defined uh, what uh, mm. what they meet. Um, and then, uh, then uh, outside of that, um, bylaws talk about styrofoam and those uh, foodware items and all the towns they referenced have uh, banned those. Uh, so uh, there's not too much variation across the board when it comes to plastic straws. Um, some towns, uh, uh, all the towns uh, make the consumer or customer ask for a plastic straw um, or they have to be uh, on display, but they also uh, are uh, distributing uh, compostable straws. Uh, so for example, I went into Northampton the other day and to a fast food restaurant and um, I couldn't even tell the difference between a plastic straw and a compostable uh, straw, uh, except one is labeled that way. So you could tell which uh, type of straw you're, you're uh, using. And in terms of exemptions, uh, uh, plastic wrap that, you, that we all use at home, and sometimes in the store, those are exempt. Um, the plastic plastic bags you see uh, that newspapers are in when they throw it onto your driveway. Uh, those are exempt. Uh, plastic bags used for dry cleaning. Uh, those are exempt. And um, so other than that, uh, the bylaws uh, talk about hardship deferments. Uh, so if, uh, if uh, a business, uh, then this could uh, even be a small um, 
uh, farm stand, uh, uh, if any of those uh, businesses uh, want to uh, argue a hardship, they would put that in writing. That would go to the uh, Board of Health, uh, and they would review that. And um, so that would uh, hopefully give an out for any business. Um, and in terms of um, enforcement, which I think uh, Jane mentioned that there might be a concern, and the way that the drafted bylaws read now, it would be uh, the town administrator designee and the fines that are uh, drafted currently in the bylaws are very similar to all the towns I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the health department uh, would still be the group to uh, review fine, uh, excuse me, complaints. And uh, as in most things, the complaints uh, go in, um, Kind of staggered order and that you would uh, start off with a, uh, a verbal warning or written warning and then if the uh, complaint continues uh, then it uh, progressively gets uh, more financially um, higher in terms of the penalty. So I don't want to go uh, any further. I, I think it'd be better if you just ask questions uh, and I do know that uh, you know the town has to vote on this so um, Bruce uh, stop can- there. Can you make sure that we all get copies of the bylaw? Because the select board has not seen an actual bylaw. All we have seen is for a, a ban, uh, you, know, you know, a warrant oh. article for the actual ban. But we haven't, I guess it's five pages long or so, and we haven't seen this yet. Oh, okay. I thought um, you did. Jennifer, I thought you were sending that. I'm sorry. No, I was working on the warrant. You didn't ask okay. me to distribute it. Yeah. Um, so, can well, you we distribute can't... it, please? What we can do is we can put a placeholder on the warrant, so your you know your spot is there. That's that's no issue. Okay. I just want to you know make sure we can all read it. That's all. Well, we the warrant has already been closed. Are we opening the warrant? No, no. If we one. haven't. So uh, let me just a uh, couple couple comments. Um, I I have a copy of the bylaw, but that I did not realize that was going to come up tonight. I thought the ban was coming up tonight, which is almost two different things. The ban is on the warrant, but I've done more of a generic. Um, a generic wording with waiting for more information, but I, I would recommend that the select board look at it. Um, I, cause I do want to make sure that every department re- understands the enforcement part of it and the fines and how that's going to happen. I think there needs to be some more discussion. So I, I think it would be helpful for you guys to get a copy. We can do that. And then yeah, you guys can I, I want to know who's going to enforce this. That is a concern of mine as well. Yeah, Absolutely. You know, I got a part-time board of health inspector now, and from what I hear, she's maxed right out with just basic stuff. We don't need to put any other kind of draw on the health department at this point right now. So we need discussion on this, and we'll yeah. continue it to the next meeting, please? We need another meeting on it for sure, yeah. But, Carolyn, we have a uh, placeholder for the ban currently yes correct? the ban and i and i looked at other communities who don't necessarily have a bylaw but have the ban and that's what i used as a placeholder but it is it's up to you what depth you want to do with that and then inevitably up to the uh, voters so uh, could, could we put that on the agenda for the next meeting to have a better yep. discussion I already, I already put a note on yeah right, thank you okay all right so i can come, come back, back. Uh, with jack or um, um, bruce i don't know what what town you went to, but I have been to other towns with the cardboard straws, and I think they should make them edible because they stick to your lips. You can't get the soda or the water or the juice out of them, and what a mess they make, you know? If, yeah. if, if the plastic straws, I understand the problem, but they haven't perfected the cardboard ones yet or, or whatever they're making of them out of. Yeah, paper, paper. Well, in all these towns, the uh, customer has the right to um, ask for a plastic straw or certainly bring in their own uh, uh, straw. Okay. Well, it uh, gets us for further discussion. So we'll bring it up again. Do you want to, uh, Jack, do you want to hit on the, how the... Sure, I do. Um, and we can take that further for the next meeting, Joyce, on some of your comments and John, you as well. So let me segue to the Hadley cleanup day which is this Saturday where we will be picking up 
plastic straws and cups and masks and things <laughs> all around town. We have 27 people who have volunteered to work from eight to three or part of that session. Solid Waste Solutions knows uh, the names of these 27 people and they will let them dump whatever they collect that day uh, at the transfer station for no extra charge, just using the bags that were donated by Home Depot. Tanda Bagel came in with some snacks as well, so I'd like to acknowledge them. Uh, Chief Mason, I see you there. I uh, just want to remind you, again, that we're going to have about 30 people on the streets, maybe a few more um, that didn't sign up, but just be aware. I know you would wanted a reminder on that. Thank uh, you. And again, that's this Saturday. A climate day is on April 23rd. That's a Saturday from 10 to 4. Uh, we have guest speakers. Um, people will be sharing their ideas on, um, a, you know, making some improvements around the way we sort of live and operate. And we have 50 people who have signed up for that event that will be mostly at the senior center and also at the community room in the library. Is that a middle of the weekday, Jeff? No, um, that's going to be Saturday, Saturday. April 23rd. Yep. Thank you. And so we tried to pick a day close to Earth Day, Joyce, and that the timing worked out well. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, something that we are moving forward with, and our intent is to get the application filed this calendar year, uh, is the Green Communities Grant. Again, once we become a green community, the designation fee coming to Hadley is about $130,000 that can be leveraged and used in other municipal uh, purposes to reduce energy consumption in the buildings. And folks from PVPC have been helping us with that. And I think we have about two criteria of the five criteria left to address, but we are making steady progress on that. Okay. Hey, hey, uh, Jack, another issue with the single use bags. You're, you you well know the uh, farm community here, and a lot of people do save their bags and give them to the farmers for their farm stands. So they're not really a single use. They're, they're a multi-use bag. I don't know how many you actually pick up on the side of the road in town, you know, in our particular town, but I know a lot of them are re being reused. Sure. And, you know, in our family, we gave them to an elderly aunt and she would reuse the bags. So we know that that happens in a lot of cases. But, John, there's also a tremendous number of these bags that are just one and done. And, you know, we see yeah, the no, effects. I a problem. I see it around, you know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just see the effects that all of this is having. Um, study after study, it's been in the headline news almost every day this week about what the international group on climate change is finding out, and we have to figure out some ways to move this forward, uh, whether it's bigger steps or smaller steps. So I, I have noticed also, Jack, that when I, on my way to work in the morning, when I do work now, because I'm partly, but anyway, when I stop at Walmart in Northampton, they have a totally different bag than what our Walmart has here in Hadley. The one in Northampton is certainly reusable um, for, and it's a little bit thicker than the thin thing that we have over here in Hadley. And I reuse it all the time or I share it with my neighbor who's, you know, doesn't go out and we put her things in it when I go shopping for her. Um, so those are really good things to have um, for other people. So, you know, that part I would certainly agree with. I'm a little bit leery about having people or, or, or restaurants because, uh, as we know, we're still trying to get them up to speed yeah. uh, with coming back after COVID and, and, and incurring another cost. I don't know what the difference would be between non-styrofoam and, and uh, uh, the other, some containers are, uh, like like a hot table uses a compostable paper, like hot box type yeah. of thing. Uh, some Chinese restaurants use those also instead of plastic. Yeah. Um. So I, you know, those kind of and things. It, I don't want to incur our our restaurants on and, and other people an extra added thing of expense that they're we're trying to break through this 
COVID business right now. And, you know, I understand where you're all coming from and I, I agree with it. I don't know if we can do it in increments or whatnot, um, yeah, but how well, quickly do we have to do this? Well, I think our ultimate goal is to encourage the use of reusable bags, mm-hmm. you know, rather than the one and done. And that's where, mm-hmm. we're, where we're moving to. Uh, Jane, it looked like you were starting to. Yeah, I was going to say a couple of the um, restaurants in our area are of a, a national chain and they're in many places, they've already changed their things, whether the town has required it or not, like McDonald's got rid of their clamshells that were mm-hmm. styrofoam and have gone to paper. And everybody knows it's coming. And this would not be, you know, voted and then, yes, it's instant. It, the date was to be January 1st, 2023 to start. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah and, and Joyce, you pointed out the difference between Hadley and Northampton. I think in Amherst at Cumberland Farms on their coffee cups, they're paper-based. And then how do they styrofoam? So a lot of these different organizations are making the move. And if we just give them a little push. The, it'll happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. And, th- and thank you all to the select board. No, thank you for doing what you're doing too. We appreciate your volunteer. Thank you. Yeah. Good job. Keep up the good work, Jack. Thanks. And, and thanks, Bruce. Thanks. Yeah. And, thank uh, you, Bruce. We'll have you guys back after we've gotten a chance to actually see what the the band reads. Um, sure. We can be a little bit more informed. You got it. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. I see next is 5.4 Housing and Economic Development Committee. Uh, we'll offer an update on their committee and projects. I see Bill is here and Molly. Who wants to go? <laughs> Um, well, I can start and Bill chime in as you see fit. <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, we just wanted to do a check in uh, periodically so that, you know, the select board's aware of the discussions that we've been having. Um, one of them was the Econo Lodge. So, um, no need to go into that because you, you heard all about that um, this evening. Um, we also had audience with uh, Lynn Gray from the Hampshire Mall. And we have been talking to them just kind of thinking um, long term about the prospects for mall properties in general in the United States post COVID. And Lynn shared with us that Pyramid has been looking at alternative uses for some of their mall properties. So she just wanted to make us aware of the fact that in Kingston, Mass, um, that they have, or they're already kind of well on their way to converting a portion of the mall to housing space. Um, So they basically took the um, JCPenney anchor store, and in their case, JCPenney's had shut down completely, um, and they converted it to um, apartments, um, I believe in that case, in Kingston. So um, just something that we thought that we should be aware of the possibilities um, and maybe try to get in front of um, what likely is coming down the road. I think some of us are old enough to have remembered the, the dead mall um, that we had years ago and it was flipped, right? It was the Mountain Farms Mall um, that fell on hard times. Um, that has kind of resurrected itself obviously. And now Hampshire Mall is in a, in a different state of affairs. So uh, again, just conversation at this point but um, putting it on the radar of the planning board. So we had three planning board members present at our meeting. So it was good for them to hear that firsthand. Um, So again, just a discussion. There's nothing being proposed formally, but we wanted to make sure that the select board was aware of the fact that those discussions are taking place at all. And it's in the spirit of kind of envisioning, um, you know, what might be, what Hadley might be looking at over the next you know, um, that as we think about what Route 9 is right now, where the status of retail properties are um, and, and where things might go from here. Um, so that's uh, one thing. Um, another discussion that we've been having is there's been some interest in having electricity turned on at the town common. So we've been uh, in touch with the building inspector about that. Um, It's something that was done in Amherst or or is done in Amherst where um, electricity is provided to the Boy Scouts when they do their Christmas tree sales and things like that. And I think um, 
that discussion was taking place because of the success of the, I can't remember what uh, it's called, but the kind of the, the bruise on the common that Christian Stanley and the Carr family um, put on. And it's been extremely well attended, but they're having to bring in their own generators. So we're just kind of thinking about, you know, what, what might it look like if the town were to um, formally offer electrical um, so that might encourage some more activity, again, under the purview of the select board on the town common. That's something else that people are interested in. Um, and then the third topic, of course, is the ho housing production plan. And that's well on its way and the committee is being formed. Um, so there was a meeting with the uh, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission that's spearheading that effort. Um, and the housing production plan, the intent is to have that completed by the end of this calendar year. So by December, and uh, Jim Maximoski is taking the point on that in terms of forming a committee that will have two representatives from the Housing and Economic Development Committee participating between now and the end of the year. Um, Bill, did I miss anything? Well, um, I'd just like to say a word about the housing production plan. Um, that is uh, the result of a grant that the planning board applied for. Uh, we received a $15,000 funding from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission for the creation of the housing production plan, which will inform the this committee, the Housing and Economic Development Committee. It will also uh, inform the uh, Hadley Affordable Housing Trust Fund and it will also give some guidance to the planning board on housing issues going forward. So uh, I wanted to uh, just mention that uh, we were successful in getting that grant. I think that was awarded in early March and uh, the work is underway on that. Sounds good, thank you. Molly, uh, what, they, what they're looking at at the uh, Hampshire Mall, is it similar to the housing that we were just talking about with the motel or it would be owned, not owned by Pyramid or? Yeah, um, to be honest, John, this is a conversation that, you know, it was started more um, informally with Lynn Gray years ago. Um, and it dates back to when I was on uh, more involved with the Amherst Area Chamber and just kind of, you know, even at that point, that, and that was pre-pandemic, just thinking about the future of the malls. And if you remember, it, at that point, the mall already was moving towards, um, I think what they referred to as more of an enter entertainment complex, right? So that they had pins coming in, they have the movie theaters, they were trying to make it more of a, of a destination for people to come to separate and apart from your traditional retail shopping because so many people were even at that point moving towards more online purchasing. So at that point, it was kind of like, well, look at, I mean, they, they already have so much real estate in town. They already have all of the parking. Um, and what other opportunities might, might present themselves. And so, you know, the pandemic hits, um, housing is obviously a huge talking point. It's a major part of the, the master plan update, you know, the need for additional housing. And so kind of resurrected that conversation with the mall to say like, obviously our zoning doesn't allow for that right now. Um, it's zoned industrial. But if Hadley were to even be open-minded to that, would the, the mall itself be open-minded to that. And that's when Lynn came forward and she said, this is great that you're even asking the question because yes, we're already doing this in Kingston. So their position is really, they're, I think they're looking for us to drive the conversation more than the traditional way of them coming forward with a proposal, knowing that the zoning is not in place now. So as yeah. Bill just said, if we have this housing production plan um, and that production plan, again, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna make this up, but hypothetically it says we need more uh, um, economically affordable housing for the senior population. We need more economically affordable housing for young families starting out, for people who are looking for apartment living. 
um, you know, whatever whatever that might look like. Yeah, that was um, my next question. How does this affect our low income housing uh, rating, as you might call it, or whatever we were looking at for percentage mm -hmm. of of housing? Yeah, but you're um, but you're talking you're talking now about putting in housing that might not even be low income. So now you're looking at the planning board in the ZBA to do a variance for some type of housing uh, apartment complex that would actually go in. And we're not talking about one story here. If you're going to put in uh, one story, you're going to put in more than that if that's what they're looking at. So now Hadley needs to take a look at, is that what we really want to look at? An increase in our housing, whether it and then in, that, in it not being low income. And now how does that affect our infrastructure? How does that affect our police and our fire and our schools and everything else that, you know, that they're talking about? So this is a big can of worms to open right now when you're talking about putting in an apartment complex at the mall. I mean, I'm I'm really kind of sitting back here thinking, oh my God, what are we doing here? Well, could I could I just jump in? I I got a, some uh, something of a different impression. Uh, Lynn Gray was sharing what Pyramid did at another location where they lost an anchor store and couldn't release a space that big. Right. Um, and that is uh, this is not anything that Pyramid is proposing for Hadley. This right. was, a, we, we didn't have a sketch of Hampshire Mall showing where apartments were going to go. Right. Uh, the only visuals that Lynn brought were sketches of what Pyramid had done in this other location. Right. So, uh, and uh, Lynn. But I, I think, but Bill, don't you think that makes us at least be sitting on an edge of if we, we really want to take a look at this if it should come down the line? Well, it, that's part of the reason we want to do the housing production plan as well to get yeah. some uh, to get some light focused on things like this, and there will be a public engagement component of the housing production plan, which will be a great place to raise questions like those you're raising now. Uh, yeah. I don't think we have answers to those, yeah. and maybe the answer will be that uh, we we just can't do it. Uh, yeah. Because among other things, we have to look not only at uh, you know what what land we have available for for such things, but what land we don't have available for such things. And mm -hmm. I was just making a presentation to another committee, and I reminded them that uh, when you look around and you see all this open land, and you hear talk about how hard it is to find housing, remember that Hadley has more land, not per capita more raw acres in the mm -hmm. uh, agricultural preservation restriction than any other community in the state. Correct. So there'll be some things that will just, you know, the, the data is going to lead us to somewhere. Mm -hmm. We need to get, need to get the data sort of assembled and mm -hmm. analyzed, and then we can see where we're going, but we're, there is no proposal on, uh, uh, there is no proposal to change any uh, zoning that right. is I, on anyone's radar at this point. I think it's just making our antennas go up, Bill. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, and, and again, it's, it's a, a long-term conversation that has to start somewhere. And, and yeah. that's, I think what, what we're saying is that it's, it's really just a conversation, um, but mm -hmm. we want to be very transparent with the select board to, to make sure that you're aware of the fact that you and again, my, my antenna is up. So <laughs> we want you. We that's what we want. <laughs> we want you. My radar at, is out. <laughs> we want you engaged at this stage and yeah. not uh, not be in the uh, the group that reads the zoning articles for the first time when they arrive at town meeting. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, as, at, at my age, Bill, and I'm not going to reflect it right now on on TV, but. I'm not dead yet, and I'm still out there. So, <laughs> okay. So anyway, that's that's the update from our committee. And certainly, at any point, um, you know, the the last meeting was recorded. You know, feel free to go back and watch that. I think it was February 
28th. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, reach out and ask any questions or, you know, again, if you have any concerns, please let us know. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Molly and Bill. Um, let's go to 5.5, return to in-person meetings. We put this on because there was a request from last time to go back to in-person meetings. So here we go. Okay, I brought it up. So uh, I would think at some point we need to either go both in person and and hybrid or whatever you want to call it and keep it so the public can attend and uh, have the public comment period in both venues in, online and in person. I don't know what everybody else thinks, but can we do hybrid for ourselves? Like, let's say somebody is traveling on business and they're not able to physically be there. Is that possible for like one of us? For one of us, yes, but you can't have, you have to have a quorum at the site of the meeting. Yeah. So you need, you need at least three people in, in the live meeting. Okay. That's fine. I mean, that's fine. I just, I know David travels for work and, yeah. you know, any one of us could travel for work, I guess, at any point. And, uh, so. and I'm, I'm, I'm off to the campground for the summer just about. So, I mean, if I have to come back for a meeting, I can come back for a meeting depending on when we start the in-person meeting. So yeah, um, I mean, we always allowed, allowed a person, you needed a minimum people on a, on a board live, but they always allowed a person or two people, whatever it may be, to uh, be remote for the meeting. So. All right, so, so what, what date do we want to start this and when do we have to start this? What's the deadline on this? I'd like to see May 18th, which is our first meeting that where we reorganize or whoever's on the board reorganizes after the election. And uh, whoever's sitting on the board at that time, they can make the decision whether it's hybrid, in person, Zoom, whatever it is. Um, that, but it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that does yeah. make sense. We've, okay. we've seen I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay. Second. I'll second. All right. Motion by Joyce and second by Jane. Yeah, we're only a couple of weeks out. Bill, what are you guys doing on the? Uh... Got to wait a minute. You got to do the vote here, John. Yeah. All right. This is not a planning board meeting, John. Nice try. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I just uh, look, you, we you don't know, care about the planning you know, board. That's something pretty good for input, and I like to listen to them. So I Never do mind. have a procedural question. Is this just for select board? Yeah, yeah. You guys, you guys can do whatever you want to do on your board. So. But they have to vote before. Have, have you guys got this sub bill or not? The current legislation allows us to stay uh, exclusively on Zoom until July 15th. Whether it will be changed after that or not, I do not know. Yeah, that's, that's the date I've seen, yeah. Yep. But have you guys discussed it or not, Bill? Uh, the last time we discussed it, uh, uh, Jim Maximoski said, why would we ever want to go back to meeting in person? And everyone nodded. Yeah. We no, have. I, uh, I agree. It's absolutely <coughs> comfortable here and we're getting the work. Done, so. uh, it's uh, been um, it's been really a help for us that people get to see what we're looking at. Plans are on the screen and not rolled out in the table with uh, people huddled over it. Yeah. And the, the audio is better. We have greater public uh, participation than we have with walk-ins. So, you know, we're, we're very happy with it, but we'll comply with the law as it evolves. So I didn't mean to jump into the middle of your vote, but I just had that question about whether it was applicable to just your board or you were giving guidance to other boards. No, no, just just for us. And so the motion is we'll stay Zoom until May 18th. We'll have we'll go to in person that day for the reorganization. And then the board can decide what they want to do from that point going forward. Is that what we're voting on? David, David, just for clarification, it will be a hybrid, correct? 
uh, starting May 8th. Well, I think it needs to be in person that first day, I think, because of the, you know, if there's new members on the board and whatever else, it, it makes sense to have that that one meeting at least in person, don't you think? Or, or yeah, I, I just want to make sure you knew you had the option to be hybrid as far well, as guess, the audience I, participation. And, and you can, I would like to look into that as far as whether the board has to fall. You may still be able to have that hybrid opportunity, but I, I, I want to, and Bill, unless you've seen that specifically during this time, I haven't as far as, I haven't seen it restricted to just one board member can be absent if you're meeting in person. That, that was the prior rule for remote yes. participation. Um, I don't know what the new rule is going to look like. Yeah. Okay, so just to be clear, we're going to stay Zoom for now, and then we'll go hybrid on the 18th, so that way the public can Zoom in if that's fine, and then let the board decide. Can I, can I get someone to remake that motion just so it's clear because uh, before we vote on it? <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer's nodding. Yeah, I, I would I would think we'd stay as as is till May 18th. At May 18th meeting, we will be in person and on Zoom uh, with with our minimum required board or the whole board or whatever. Yeah. So I just need a, a motion and a second again, so that way Jennifer can do the minutes. All right. So, so moved. So second. All right, motion by John, second by Joyce. And uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? <clears throat> yes. Dungaloo? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay, 5.6 representative carries request for earmark projects. Carolyn? Sure. Um, I'll be really quick. Uh, Representative Carey uh, uh, met with me and to talk about possible earmarks for, there's a, a considered an ARPA-2 for infrastructure coming down the road and also earmarks for the state budget. And I would like to give the select board an opportunity to give me feedback on that, if there's any projects that they feel would be appropriate. I do have three that I would suggest, but I would also like to hear your input and it, you don't have to give me the input today. Um, because I have until about the 13th to get back to Representative Carey. Uh, my, suge my suggestions right now would be the three that have come really to the forefront um, is, uh, the, you know, I've been talking a lot about the dike and in that second phase of the levy assessment when that, with that inspection, it was clear that we needed some pretty significant repairs. Um, this year, I put in 7000 into the DPW budget for some real, really basic, basic, basic things. This would be asking for about $60,000 um, to go up to that next level of some more in-depth um, minor repairs to help us get to that um, accreditation level many years down the road and to get us at a baseline. Um, that was one of them. Uh, the, uh, the Parks and Recreation um, also had a conversation with Representative Carey, um, and, but I would like to do it collectively. They would like to um, build a softball field and the total cost of that would be about 96,000. That would include parking lot, the field, uh, the, um, what do you call it? it uh, where do you sit when you're playing, when the, when the girls- Please dug out. Bleachers. Dug out. Um, so the total cost of that um, is about $95,000, $96,000. And then one that I really feel strongly about and I don't have an estimate for is just the engineering cost to look at South Maple. Um, you know, the water lines there are very, they're aging, they're very small. There's a concern about safety, which um, that the state really does respond to that really well when it's a safety issue as far as putting out fires. So we could not afford that whole project. Um, but if we could just try to get some um, engineering um, costs done, it might not be the whole area, but um, Tony's getting some estimates for me for um, the cost for maybe possibly sections. So that I'll have a better idea what we would present to Representative Carey. Those are the three I have, but if you have any, please let me know. You don't have to decide tonight, um, but please let me know. And um, I think I it's about the, I think right. If if you could give me uh, some suggestions on um, on the next select board meeting, that would be great. 
if I have to get it in sooner, I'll let you know. But it's certainly not a vote. It's just giving me suggestions, and I'll give them to them. Listen, uh, Caroline, I had mentioned it before, and everybody ignored me, but uh, water treatment at Mount Warner is going to be a big issue. And there's $19 billion released, the governor, according to the beacon I was just reading, uh, from state and federal. It's a project we don't even have in the works right now, not even engineered. You got mm -hmm. Big Road and South Maple Street, which are 1900 uh, cast iron uh, water mains. Mm -hmm. South Maple is a part of it, but Bay Road is the other big part that's left from the 1900s. So we, we've got we've got a lot more water issues and wastewater issues. To, the infrastructure, you know, I know we're making progress on it, but it, it needs to be addressed constantly not just at these these points in time you know well and, and i hear we, you john and you're going to hear about it in a few minutes so i, I hear you know, i know well we talked about expanding the sewer treatment plant um adding more streets onto the sewer instead of septic tanks so those are things that i think we should look at also well, you still got the option of pumping to Amherst too. And if we had a water treatment plant, I'm sure we could make a regional deal between the water and the wastewater with Amherst. We have been working on it quite a bit. I know we have. And I know I spoke with Gilbert. We had a few meetings about this. And I think it's really something that we need to address sooner rather than later at this point. If there's that yeah. much money available through state and federal, uh, yeah, th these are these aren't big dollars that he's talking about. No, these are big dollars that I'm talking about. Right. Oh, okay. I thought you were, you wanted me to bring those two that Representative Carey. No, no, exactly. He he should be helping us with this stuff if we can get grant money or whatever we can get. You know, these are projects that that if we could get the engineering, yeah. under, I think we could work on them. You know. All right, um, I'm going to hit uh, seven and eight real quick, and then we'll go to water and sewer. Uh, 5.7 Child Abuse Awareness Proclamation. The Select Board is asked to declare April National Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. The proclamation Who's asking will... us to do this? Where did this come from? It came uh, from the children. I'm sorry, David. No, go ahead. It came from the children's advoc advocacy group there out of Northampton is the Children's Advocacy for Hampshire County. Is that right, Mike Mason? Mike's been working with them. Yes. 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 And the district attorney's office. Okay. And um, well, hold on. I lost the board docs page. Uh, the pr proclamation will also be read Thursday, April 7th at 930 a.m. on the front steps of Town Hall. All are welcome to attend who would like to attend. And uh, I'm not going to read the pro proclamation since it is uh, in board docs and it'll be read tom uh, tomorrow morning. But if uh, we just need a motion and a vote to declare this as National Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. So moved. Second. All right, motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on this? Uh, Jennifer? Roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Evan Smith? Yes. Changalu? Yes. Wiscavitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. Okay. And 5.8 DPW Wastewater Advisor. DPW would like authorization to hire a part-time wastewater advisor. And... Um, my understanding is this is the authorization to create the position or announce the position, not to hire anybody at this point, correct? Um, Carolyn, you want me to yes, please. jump in? Hi. Um, yeah, I, I'm. we're here to ask for your support of this proposal uh, that's kind of been proposed by Scott uh, with uh, Carolyn and me and the DPW union working together um, to work out the parameters of an agreement between the town and uh, the union to hire temporarily 
uh, a soon to be retired town employee who will help, who has a grade four license, um, which is required um, by the town to have, um, to serve as a kind of a bridge in the staffing while we build up the capacity elsewhere uh, in, in the town DPW um, for wastewater. Uh, we can hire uh, a soon to be retired individual with a license uh, to help us train everybody in the department. We have one other licensed grade four uh, wastewater treatment operator. We have, I think, a provisional wastewater treatment operator grade four who's, who's working to make that permanent. Um, but it really is incumbent upon the town to make sure that it's always protected and that, that it always has the capacity to have somebody working during business hours who has the grade four license that we're required to have by the state and, and uh, federal governments um, for the plant. Um, we're looking at a short term bridge till we build that capacity internally. Um, the, the position which would work up to 12 hours a week, um, probably not 52 weeks a year, but uh, could. Uh, it would be a union position, but it wouldn't be eligible for any benefits of the union, but because it's um, union type work, the, the DPW union wanted to keep that position in the union, but it wouldn't have any benefits. Um, we would pay a flat hourly rate that wouldn't be subject uh, to overtime or the other DPW um, union pay charts. It wouldn't be eligible for uh, grievances or arbitration process. And basically, it's going to be a position that will help train existing staff, will assist us with state and federal permitting responsibilities, uh, help the town to further document the location of all the water lines and equipment, and then to staff the facility on uh, shifts that no permanent staff uh, who is licensed is able to fill. So that if there are occasional weekend shifts that can't be filled or we don't want somebody working seven days a week, uh, week in and week out, this position could occasionally fill a weekend shift. Um, and that's basically what we're here to do. We, we hammered out an agreement with the union for an MOU that you've got in front of you uh, with the position. We would need to post it and then we would uh, hire. So moved. Second. Motion by Joyce, second by Jane. Any other discussion on this? Yeah. Um, originally, when you developed the DPW and put it in place, um, they they were at that time to take a supervisor out of the water, to take a supervisor out of the union and the wastewater, as you did with the DPW with the highway department. You've got a foreman over there now. Uh, you've got a superintendent over there, and we've got a DPW director over so you actually got three people out of the union in supervisory roles where uh, the water department and the wastewater department at one time when you were developing the DPW were, uh, were planned for the future to take those two positions and take them out of the union. That's the way I had understood it when they put the DPW together. We have had a part-time out of the union employee to fill in on the weekends who worked through our plant to get his license and ended up filling the spot, which I think is a great idea. You know, if you got a chance to get somebody with a license, the license are far and few between for water and wastewater. We are lucky enough to have the four operators right now in the water department. And as you bring these new people into the DPW, if there's somebody interested in the water or the wastewater field, as I said over the last nine years, you know, there should, should be something in the schools that, that start training these people 
for some of these positions if they're really interested. It's just been ignored for too long. And myself, I only got a year left now here, really. And uh, Dennis is gone now. And you're going to be stuck uh, without any operators, you know. We really need to encourage the whole staff at some point to go ahead and if they're interested, if they're capable of getting their licenses and moving moving the whole town forward at that point, you know. Couldn't agree more. Okay. So anything else on this before we vote? All right, Jennifer. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalu. Yes. Wiskevitz. Abstain. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Deb. Um, let's jump back up to 5.1 water and sewer infrastructure fee discussion. And uh, who's going to start off on this? I'm going to start off, David, and then we're also going to have uh, Linda, Susan, and Dan join. They're, they're each going to take a different portion. I want to thank you all for being so patient. Um, it was really important that we put this bu budget together for this year. Um, we spent a lot of time with Scott, his staff, and we met several times to make sure these two budgets, the enterprise um, funds for the water and sewer, were as accurate as possible. I think historically there was probably some contingencies that were built into that budget to help pay for infrastructure um, costs, but this really enterprise funds are truly operating budgets. So we wanted to make sure that we went through it. I'm, I'm gonna um, have Linda pull it up really quickly. I, I promise you, I won't go line item by line item, um, but I, I do wanna just highlight to show you where the areas where we did make cuts, you're gonna see, um, I think we're doing, Water, let's see, is it water or sewer first? Uh, let's see, I guess it's sewer. It's, oh, okay. Um, so what, what I wanna do is I just wanna go, go and show you what we did. If I just can re bring you back to these, uh, the green where FY22 voted and FY22 actual. This is what we used as the baseline when we were budgeting. So with Scott's input and other staff, we were able to look at areas what we felt didn't reflect what was spent in former years and wasn't getting spent year to date. So if you go down, so if you go down to overtime, Scott looked at that and felt that's, uh, yeah, for, felt that we could um, reduce some of that based on um, knowing what the staffing was and what the needs were going to be. Um, if we go down to electricity, uh, we felt now I have to tell you this, these were done before, uh, the war began in more, uh, between, um, Russia and Ukraine. We know that's going to be impacting some of these budget numbers. Um, so we're pretty confident that this is going to be okay, but I'm, I'm in some of these utilities, there is going to be an, an, an unknown for next year. Um, some of the biggest ones were professional services and engineering. And as you look back, um, we, we really were trying to make sure that there wasn't too much uh, budgeted for those line items. So other professional services, um, we reduced that by 33,000. Cause again, we looked back on the history to see what was being spent and what was budgeted for. Um, we also looked at engineering services. Again, this one was a real, uh, we, we just, we had to look at bills that were paid and that $45,000 was just not accurate based on past history and where we were to date. So so we, we reduced that. So there's a, there's additional ones, but that, that the total reduction, um, can you just scoot that up? And I'm going to just, yeah, is $64,000 just out of that budget alone. So what I want to just assure you, if these, the suggestions and recommendations that we're going to make tonight are based on and looking at our operating budgets as they, as we feel is the most accurate. Um, I do want to point to the highlighted area because this is going to be the highlight of a discussion when we talk about the infrastructure fee. This is the debt service. And after we go through the next budget, the next enterprise fund, Linda is going to talk to you about the budget, the budget service and what it costs to, to pay for infrastructure. So do you have any questions about this budget? On sewer, yeah. Okay, same thing with same thing with water. We did the same thing. 
Um, the bigger cuts are areas that we look back on past uh, spending practices and felt that there we, we were safe to do some reductions. Um, you know, again, done before, you know, these last four weeks. So we, again, unknown, but um, we, we just feel that these are more accurate. If you go down to equipment repairs and maintenance, we've got some newer um, uh, trucks. So we are hoping that it's not gonna be such a significant impact. Um, where are you? Did I go in the right place? Yep. Where I did the reduction. No, that's an increase. Where was uh, I? Looking? I was just looking somewhere. With okay. I'm um, sorry. Uh, that's yeah. okay. Uh, 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 let's. Yeah, the I'm vehicle sorry. repairs went down a little bit, and yeah. then the, the water the water building systems went down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So those are the type of. Um, you know, really taking a magnifying glass to these two budgets so that we're working on it at the same baseline. So what I want to do is, be, you know, before Linda goes into the heart of the infrastructure um, fee, I just want to let you know um, that when we when we presented that and when we you you approved the infrastructure fee last year, um, it probably could have been explained better. And now we understand that there was an un, uh, um an understanding or um, that people who had, um, um, that were on water and didn't have sewer were paying for sewer infrastructure. And that is with the, re the recommendation of how we would, we are gonna be requesting the select board to split those two. Um, I think you're gonna feel confident to know that water is not paying for infrastructure in sewer, that the water is uh, infrastructure fee on the bill for water is gonna pay for water and the one on sewer is gonna pay for sewer. So with that, I just wanna just let you know, we do realize that it was not clear last year and where that's where some of the misunderstanding is, but I think it is important that you first listen to um, Linda as she talks to you about debt service, because um, we are not on a, on a good trend on, on bringing in enough revenue to support these, um, these infrastructure projects. And we did take the projects that needed to be out of the operating budget, that should be out of the operating budget. Um, so I'm going to let Linda focus on the debt service right now. Okay. And, I, and I, again, we have the, in both cases, we have principal and interest are part of the, what we consider the operating budget. And so we all think that the uh, sewer rates and water rates are to cover the operating, the operating budget. And then we have our principal and interest, which we vote separately, but um, we've also included that as being funded by the rates. And um, given the way budgets are increasing at a fairly predictable rate and a slower curve and the way we're increasing our, our, our um, infrastructure expenses, we're gonna have, we, we should consider, we recommend you consider treating them differently. So I thought in order to show you what this means, this is, I'll just flip down quickly so you see what it is. This is part, this is the water and sewer portion of the debt schedules that I keep track of. I have them in all of, in our other areas, but this is just the water sewer page. So the top of the page is um, is the, uh, the the water debt payments, and they've been going along. We we're paying for the the wells of uh, various projects in the past, and what I highlighted in yellow are the items that we have already approved. We approved these at last town meeting, and they are very significant new items. Um, I know uh, it's. It, you know, to think that, oh, well, now we need to put in our infrastructure fee to cover infrastructure. And you say, well, we've been paying this debt and interest and you're now trying to call infrastructure. We've been doing this for years under the rates. And so why are we doing something different? Um, because we're doing, uh, we're doing quite a leap in those areas. So for the items that we approved last year in water, just water for, uh, for payment out of water reserves and out of the budget, uh, we approved 805,000 for water lines. We approved uh, 70,000 for a truck. I recognize that's not infrastructure, but the hydrant valves and repairs, that is infrastructure. So we have $865,000 worth of approved infrastructure just in water. And if you see here what the impact of that is, when, I, when, I, um, when we add those in, um, uh, paying the water lines over 10 years and the other two items over five years, you see we're taking a leap where we had an FY20, we paid 186,000, then 205, 
22 this year, last year, and the look at the leap to next year of what we're going to have to be paying in order to service that debt. Um, and um, I'll get back to that. We may not need all that the first year, but I'm just showing you what the potential that that could be. And then dropping down to sewer, I'm going to show you the same kinds of things that here early on in the sewer debt payments, we're paying for uh, the pump stations still. This is, and you can see they go a long ways off to the right there. They're going to be done in a few more years. Um, engineering study, driveway, various things that we have, that we are on uh, paying on an ongoing basis out of hey, the bonds. Okay. Yeah. Hey, the, those two pump stations, those are the ones that were built uh, five years ago now, correct? uh built five years ago this is they went into our 2014 bond so okay. it probably yeah, i think it's one in four yeah one in four yeah correct okay. yeah. yeah um yeah they're a little a little older yeah so um okay so the uh, what we have on the that we have again approved at last year's town meetings just in 22. We approved one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for sewer lines and one hundred thirty thousand for sewer pipe and uh, lining repairs. Now, there's a reason. I mean, we as as John mentioned earlier, we are, do have a lot of infrastructure needs, and the reason these came online and were voted just last year was because Route Nine is being uh, being worked on, and so we're going to piggyback on that project. So that specifically is why we will have one hundred and twenty thousand in the sewer lines and eight hundred and five thousand in the water lines. Um, and again, if those go on and we pay them, we're, we're looking at increases in that budget going from where we've been carrying debt and interest on sewer at 130,000, we're now going to jump to 186 and that will continue for a while. Um, so that's what we've already approved. And, and Linda, you need to add that by piggybacking with the state, it saves us a, a million plus. Yeah, it's a good idea to do this. I'm not, this is not a bad thing that we approve to these projects. This is definitely uh, the, the, the best way that we could be going at this time. But we nonetheless have to pay for what we what we have taken on. Linda. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the piggyback is the best way to go. And we've had the water line actually underway since they finished the last section, the uh, second phase of Route 9. That's how right. long we've been working on this water line uh, right. improvement on Route 9. Right. Right. Okay, so then I'm going to, so I have some squares I did at the bottom. I try not to just throw a lot of numbers and, and try and focus in on what's important. So I'm going to review here again our new infrastructure, which is already approved. There's the uh, the water amounts. I'm just, I'm not going to include that truck. It's the water, uh, the water line replacement repairs, the hydrant, the hydrant and uh, valve repairs uh, for water, and then for sewer, the Route Nine uh, and the and the pipes. So that's a million dollars last year. That's that's a uh, that's a good amount of money between the uh, water and the sewer. Now, what's pending at this coming uh, annual meeting? We still have more things to go. Uh, they're asking for a painting to paint the water wells, uh, the, the two of the wells, Mount Warner and Holyoke Wells. Um, they were cleaned a, f a while ago. Now they need to be painted, um, 310,000. Um, if I take that over 10 years, and this is just, uh, I'm not sure I did that. Yeah, I think I did calculate some interest in it, 3%. So that will be another 31,900, almost 32,000 to be paid annually in, out of water. And for sewer, the pump station roofs, I guess all for every, uh, they all need to be repaired. They've been there long enough, so that having issues, they have to be replaced. And then something with communications. I'm sorry, I, I don't have a good description there, but um, that's 105,000 in more in sewer. Um, we vote these things through, and typically when these articles come up at town meeting, we vote them through fairly easily because the answer is always we pay them uh, uh, to be paid out of water reserves, to be paid out of sewer reserves, and we've been able to carry that year after year because as something comes off something else goes on and it's you know we stay in that medium range as you can see when i look back at the total amount from 20 and 21 we've been able to maintain it um, with these kinds of leaps and knowing that there's more coming 
it's no longer sustainable that we just continue along and hope they're going to sque- we're going to squeeze them into the budget. We have reserves for sewer and for water that we do tap into when the bu- budget runs short and we- or when we need to pay down these debts. But they will only go down and they are going down further. And um, we need to start thinking of these as the stabilization fund for water and sewer. We only use stabilization fund for the general fund items and for the school. So if we make a plan that we're going to spend that right down to zero before we do anything, then there's no backup in those areas. And nothing can happen more. I mean, I, I can't think of an area where we've had more sudden emergencies than with water and sewer. We need to have some backup plan for paying for that money. We can't be running those reserves down to to nothing. So um, so if we assume that these are going to go through and I take those monthly payments, we're now looking at a a monthly payment increase on the infrastructure for 135,000 for water and 74,000 for sewer beginning in 24. Now, we may not take that full leap of the pre-approved one in 23. We're probably only going to go half there because they're starting that work this spring and we won't have to borrow the full amount. Yet we will have to see the full amount then for 24 going forward. Likely we are going to borrow the far, the full amount for what's coming on uh, what we're voting this month. So we're looking at pretty hefty increases here. Um, and we have um, that we had the fee going on for infrastructure fee, and we all admit it was a clumsy rollout. Uh, we were dealing with a situation where the uh, sewer was uh, the, the budget needed funds, and we put the infrastructure fee on, and there wasn't. It, it just happened fairly quickly, and you know the way we explained it and the way it came across with select board. I can understand. Um, that there were misunderstanding, misunderstanding, misunderstandings about it and things to explain and, and how are we going to get out of this one and the, and the reaction from people that we need to get rid of this infrastructure fee because it's not fair that everyone gets charged this fee on their bills, but not everyone is on sewer. And that's something certainly is, is, is a legitimate complaint. And had we had the foresight to see this coming, we might have rolled this out a little bit differently. And I'm sure you would have wanted to do that too. But here we are. Um, now, um, I'm going to turn this over to Susan, because if we look at these increases that, that we're looking at, and these are just the increases, not the totals. These increases and the um, amount that's been raised that is being raised currently by the infrastructure fee changed on the bills, charged on the bills is just is under $100,000. So we have not even fully solved the problem of the upcoming increases with the infrastructure fee. Um, and um, I think I will now then uh, turn it over to Susan to explain why with each within each of the categories that they will be nicely covered by uh, not covered by, but the the fees being charged on the invoices for water customers can go to water structure infrastructure, and what's being charged to sewer customers will go to sewer infrastructure. and And I think that hopefully that that will solve that issue among people. So, any any questions on the debt schedule? <laughs> All righty. I'm going to um, I'm going to have to switch over to something. <clears throat> Stop share there and then share again so I can go over to a Word document. Um, Sorry, I did it in tables. I should have okay. done it in Excel. <laughs> I used to be able to. I don't know. I mean, I've just gotten so awkward lately. Um, Susan, you wanted to go, I think, to this one first. Yes. Okay. So um, when the complaint came in that, uh, you know, there's no way sewer uh, water users should have to uh, pay a portion of, or $10 $10 or any portion thereof um, to fund sewer, it should be in rate. Uh, We drilled down numbers big time um, and we have, we have plenty of them for you. However, 
what we did was uh, we looked at, as of today, the number of water users, the number of sewer users, total number of irrigation meters makes uh, a difference because those are people who have installed the second meter um, for outside watering because the theory is anything that goes into a house goes through the sewer system. Uh, so irrigation meters are, are the exception. So when you look at our numbers, uh, 1,035 sewer users divided by 2,278 water users equals 45%. So if we, uh, if, if we separate, if we divide out the revenues from the infrastructure charge, 55, 45, um, what, you're, what you will look at is the total infrastructure committed this year, for instance, is $96,040. Water will be 50, what will go to water is 52,822. What will go to sewer is 43,218. Um, and the financial management team kind of thought that was a fair way to do this. Uh, we need the revenue um, and this makes sense. Does anybody have any questions about this portion of it? Uh, I was just, from the original 28,000 to 96,000. The, the original fee was 28,000 or so. In 21. In, in 21, uh, because it was fourth quarter, it was like 23,000 and something. Okay, that was only one quarter then. Yeah, and that all went to sewer. And, and that was our kind of, and apologetically, that was our bumble. That was, um, that was for the sleeve lining project that we did, I believe, right? Well, it covered that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I think, unfortunately, like, like Carolyn mentioned, you know, we, we could have done a better job of explaining the need for this rather than just saying it's going to be directed to sewer. Um, but the reality is whether the money comes from here or comes through taxation or come, it's got to come from somewhere. And, uh, you know, I don't want to see overrides if, if we can prevent them. But, you know, we're kind of hitting our limit on things here where we're going to be left with overrides if we, if we cut out all the, cut out this fee and then, you know, where are we going to get the money from? So that, that's the problem people got to realize. Well, and honestly, if you do nothing um, in two years, there will be no sewer reserves. Right. And then we're looking at a whole different world of state involvement. Yep. And, and I get it. People don't want to spend the money, but it's got to, something's, something's got to pay for the infrastructure. And when you actually, we should we should go to Dan at this point because he has done he has drilled down numbers like you can't believe and and surrounding areas, which granted are different operations than us, but everybody is seeing these huge increases, and and their rates are much higher than ours. Not that one, Dan's. Linda. Oh, you don't want to? Okay. Uh, yeah, let's okay. have Dan. You want to do that first? Okay. Um, give me a moment. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are you there, Dan? Yep. Do you want the, uh, which one do you want? Oh, uh, that, the, the one you had up. Okay, there we go. Okay. Okay. Now, this is a few area communities that have had changes in 21, 22, and have already voted for 23. Now, I know we're not these communities. We're not, don't like to be compared to any of them, but this indicates their costs are going up and they've raised rates. I mean, Northampton voted zero this year. I think that was just a smoke and mirror because Coke is going away for 24 and they use a third of the water. 
So they're looking at probably close to a 40 to 50% increase in water yeah. in 24. And they're trying to tell people, well, we're, we're not going to go up this year because you're going to go up next year. East Hampton did a three-year, basically 15% for sewer starting last year, this year, and next year. Hatfield's gone up 30% the last two years, and Amherst has gone up 21 and a half in sewer in the last two years. Um, what what is happening in the last 12? Yeah. And it, I don't think they voted anything for 23, Amherst and Hatfield yet, or I haven't found anything. I'm sure that's coming. And then if you can switch to the other chart. Uh, this chart does not have the additional debt and uh, interest payments on it for 23. But if you look, if you leave the infrastructure fee, which I had at one third, if you bump it up another 11,000, that drops more. That shows that we're right now, uh, we'll be $43,000 out of balance if we take in the same amount of money that we took in in 21, in 22. So it. It's not as dire as what Ty and Bond was making out that, oh, we need to go up 43%. The cuts that Carolyn and Scott made in the budget, that, that really relates to about a, or equates out to about a 9% rate increase by reducing the budget. So no. there really needs to be some adjustment. Like Susan said, in, in two years, the sewer reserve is probably going to be gone if you do away with the sewer reserve. I mean, the impact fee. You know, the other big thing that you still haven't touched on is the unfunded mandates from the state and the federal government with the rules and regulations that we have to pay for. And we don't have a choice in that matter either. You know, we, we, we've got to come up That's with that. That's just it, John. Yeah, no. I, we I, I have mean, to fund them and it has yeah. to be funded through the enterprise. Yes, and and you, but you need to tell them that it, it these unfunded mandates are things that are really killing our water and wastewater uh, enterprise funds. It, it's not so much the infrastructure. You you still have the infrastructure either way. It's the unmandated uh, funding that that we just a small town like us can't afford. You know, without raising the rates. Yep. So, go ahead. Uh, these rate calculations also, if you, you think back to last year, fiscal 21 or last fall and summer, that this was one of the wettest years we've ever had. Farmers were losing crops because there was too much rain. People weren't watering outside. If we have a drier summer this year, there'll be a lot more water usage, but it's impossible to tell at this point how much water is gonna get used for outdoors. And honestly, you know, from from a revenue side, we hope, 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 hope for hot, 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 dry summers because that funds our enterprise. As long as we don't hit water restrictions. Well, we do. And <laughs> that's still, you know. Right back, on that. right back to the other statement I made. You know, we need to address the Mount Warner situation to produce more water, you know, and it's going to cost money to do it. So, and what's more infrastructure, John? Yeah. So, no, what's the infrastructure? It, it's another treatment facility that's mandated again, unfunded mandates from Which the is federal government which is infrastructure. A treatment plant is infrastructure. Yeah. So what's the recommendation here? There, There's option. We want to go through the, the option is uh, certainly we, we're comfortable with the uh, infrastructure base staying on. It's really, this is a select board vote. Uh, Susan has one, uh, has a chart showing um, what the recommended increase would be in the rates to cover uh, to cover with or without the infrastructure fee. I mean, if you were to do away with the inter infrastructure fee, it would be a larger increase in the rates. Um, so, I mean, in one way or the other, the bills need to get paid. And that's really, you know, that's a select board decision. Um, we like the infrastructure 
fee because the matter, I guess there's some flexibility there for us. Um, so Susan, do you want to show your other chart? Um, or are you? Sure. It, well, is Dan finished? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, so what does, yeah, so we always come down to what does this really cost people? Okay, so uh, yeah, let's yeah. Put it small, a little bit smaller, okay. Is it so small? What I wanted to, you want it bigger? The, nope, that's good. Um, the top table, I just wanted to let you folks know it, this is a five-year historical of the amount of water uh, sewer reserves that were uh, committed to me to collect um, and a 3% increase to those. This is the dollar amount we're talking about. It's not big dollars. Um, in the second table, um, I have a number of different uh, rate structures because we have a tiered rate and um, I kind of picked out various things. So with a 3% sewer rate increase with the infrastructure fee, um, so the first one would be, uh, you know, any sample single elderly person living by themselves, their quarterly rate increase would be 34 cents. The second one, I took my bill. Um, I would be paying quarterly $2.38. And uh, the third one was, uh, I think a duplex, uh, commercial small would, I don't, it was a small office. Um, but so, you know, that's what you're looking at. The commercial large was a hotel. Um, and that's, that essentially is less than one night room rate in where's, any of our hotels. Where's the seasonal so, farm use, Susan? Seasonal farm use? Yeah. What would they um, Farmers aren't on sewer, John. Uh, some are. Uh, most of them have irrigation meters, which for outside use. So they're only paying water, John. No, I understand that, but some are on sewer. Give me one. I, I can't think of one seasonal farmer who is. I mean, you know, even uh, um, the folks who grew mums on Route 9, Julia, uh, they had an irrigation meter to, to water the mums. I, I, I can't think of anybody who is. So, so that first one is if we keep the infrastructure fee, this would be the kind of increase yes. over what they're seeing right now. Yeah. Because because the infrastructure fee is already on. And then if you were to take the infrastructure fee away, then, then we two have other, to two other options. Right. And then we have to replace the fifty two thousand dollars going to water and the forty three thousand dollars going to sewer that was raised through the infrastructure. Um, and so that would uh, amount to a five percent water increase and a seven percent sewer increase. And you can see what that that does to the the various categories of, of rate structure. So it's you know it's, so it's great for the residential small and residential medium, but then it goes rather large for everybody. So this this looks like it more than doubles it for the last five categories. Sure. And it's certainly Absolutely more does. than the $10 plus whatever was up above in the, that table. Yeah. 
That's true, because the $10 applies no matter how small your right um, or your, your bill is. Right. So it, it does it does change the uh, it, it swings the responsibility. That's sure. I, I guess why 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 we think the combination of the two actually is can you slide it's the more equitable. equitable. I think it's more equitable. Back up, John. Yeah, um, good. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So right now, the ten on the upper chart we're looking at the infrastructure free of ten dollars a quarter, plus yep. for my house I assume two dollars and thirty eight cents a quarter, so twelve dollars and thirty eight cents, or fifty dollars a year rounded up to make this system whole, as opposed to moving down to um, the water rate increase, which would be less for me, but not good for the town, because I don't right. have sewer. Oh, this is only right. sewer, I'm sorry. Okay. I was looking at water. Well, no, without the infrastructure fee, we have to increase both because we have to replace the revenue that we're recommending would go to water and then the revenue that would go to sewer. So you'll be paying more regardless. Um, right. Yeah. All right. So I like your, I would like to move that we accept the rate you're offering of the 10% infrastructure fee with the 3% sewer rate increase. $10. We can't, we can't do the, well, we can't do a rate increase. No. Oh. Yeah, we have to. The rate has, we well, have to hold a hearing, which, I, which um, so it's really two separate issues, but I would recommend that you as, well, as commissioners would hold that probably at the end of May to have a rate increase. But well, we can. And I think can, that makes sense. That would be a public hearing. But we can vote on keeping the infrastructure for you or yes. getting rid of it, whatever. And, uh, and how, how you want it split. Yes. Right. All right. So All can right. you show us the split again? Just the, the percentage, just so that we can make that for the motion. The 45, 55%. Yep. Oh, oh okay. It's, um, it's the other one, Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> there are two different documents, unfortunately. So. I'm so glad yeah. you're doing that instead of me. <laughs> I'm sweating. <laughs> it's a long meeting with a lot of numbers already. So we got to make sure we got it. Is. <laughs> okay, I move that we keep the infrastructure fee and a, a proportionate to 45% to the sewer and 55% to the water it, uh, fees. Is this going forward uh, for 23 or are you voting on 22? And, and I can't remember. I think we need to clean up the mess that has been made as soon as possible yes, because of absolutely. the confusion. Absolutely. So as soon as it can go into effect. I'll second that, Jane. Okay, motion by Jane, second by John. Any other discussion on this? Jennifer, could you roll call, please? Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chungalo. Linda, I'm going to ask you to stop sharing now, okay? Yes, I will. Thank you. Chungalo. Uh. Choo toys. Maybe we lost her. I don't know. She's muted, so. All right. Uh, let's. Uh -oh. Okay, uh, Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Okay. Right. Question technicality. Is the water thing, can John vote on it? Yes, it's it's uh, infrastructure. It's already infrastructure okay. fees. Thank you. It has nothing to do with the specific department. It's all for the whole town, in the best interest of the town. Uh, I do have one more question for Susan. I don't see the large seasonal farmers on the water side either, either one of those sections. So what are they, residential or commercial? So what would they be charged? I think they're charged commercial. Actually, John, 
what I what the first chart is is only sewer. So with infrastructure fee, it's only sewer, and without um, infrastructure fee. And you're right. I didn't do. Fun. It, it's not there. Sorry. It's not on the second part, and it's not. Uh, and it, they are charged commercial, I believe, right now. Aren't no, they? they're not. No, they're charged the same as uh, the high rate. Hang on. Hold on. No, no, no. They're not. It's uh, it is the two dollars and fifty eight cents. Um. Well, I just want it's the I, lowest of the residential. Okay. The so, agricultural rate is. All right. See, you didn't. Yeah. That, that was the part that you didn't have on that I. I seen the second box before when you went back to talk about the first box and I'm like, uh, you had the water fee and the Sorry. water fee, okay? Yeah, because uh, the the agricultural rate is $2.58 per hundred okay. cubic feet. It's the same as the municipal rate and okay. the baseline of the um, residential. Yeah, yeah. All right. I thought that's what it was. But so it was so they would see, so, so the farmers would see a 34 cent increase um, essentially in their bill, depending you know, on how much their exactly. usage was. Because the, the seed's going up, the fertilizer's going up, and on and on and on. Yep. And... For all of us. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you, um, you know, Linda, Dan, Susan. Carol and everyone else that that was involved. I know, um, you know, it was it was an issue and it took a lot of time to run through all these numbers. So thanks for all the time that you, you put in and hopefully this keeps us on the right path for being solvent. So, uh, but thank you. Um, all right, so to try to move this along a little bit, 6.1, can we- I'll put that on next, next meeting. Thank you, that's what I was gonna ask. Uh, Megan's way, um, can we just, uh, vote to accept that at this point? That's pretty cut and dry. Mm -hmm. yep. So if I, if I could get a motion on that. Move to accept. Second. Okay. Motion by Jane, second by John. Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Chunglo. Wiskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And then, um, Carolyn, do you mind if we skip your administrator report for this evening? No, I only just if any of you want to attend tomorrow for the flag raising that Chief Mason will be doing for um, the, the um, proclamation that you, you did for um, the uh, child abuse awareness. So if anybody wants to attend that, they can. And um, yeah, nothing else. I can, anything else can wait. And then can, I can do it in an email. <laughs> perfect. And yeah. then uh, 6.3 annual town meeting warrant. If we could just vote to close yep. the warrant this evening and then we'll review it at future meetings. We've got time. Um, they sent them the warrant out this afternoon. So hopefully everyone got a chance to review it. Yeah. Just, I just need you to close it so we don't get any more submissions. Or I move we close the warrant. Second. Motion by Jane, second by Amy. And anything on that? Jennifer, roll call, please. Y'all are working my hand out here at the end. Um, roll call vote, Phil? Yes. Nevin Smith? Yes. Wiskevitz? Yes. And Parsons? Yes. Thank you. If All we right. need to sneak another meeting in, David, you know, I, I think maybe we should. And yep. we've got a few things to discuss here. We'll see if... Uh, I'll get with, with Carolyn and Jennifer and see what we have left and what we have coming up next meeting. And if we need another one, we'll pop one in. Sure. I have something I'd like on next meeting, which is the a concept about flying the Ukrainian flag in solidarity. All right, yeah, we can put it on there to talk about. We'll put it on. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Um, announcements. Uh, the Hadley Mothers <laughs> Club are, is going to have their cleanup day on April 23rd. 
at the elementary school, as always, uh, for your household items. I believe if you go to the Mother's Club, they will have a list of things they will be accepting and the fees for them. Anything else? I believe there's an Easter Bunny coming to town this weekend. That that was one of the announcements on my time. Details, I'll go back to it. <laughs> it's, yeah, Parks and Rec, um, and it will be the Easter Bunny again, snacks, and um, I think that's petting. pictures. Oh, yes, petting zoo. Yes. Just sheep, but... And where is it? Where and when? It's at the, let's elementary see, school. elementary school on the 9th at 1030. Okay. Any other announcements? Jane, are you still doing um, random testing, COVID testing at the senior yes, center? Yes, we are. All right, because... Uh, uh, did you see that letter from UMass? I guess they're going to... Be... They're closing down their yeah. sites, yes. Yes. Just call yeah. and make an appointment. It's only once a week now because there's been so little demand. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So if there's nothing else, if I could get a motion to adjourn. Motion I'm to adjourn. Fine, second. All right, motion by Jane, second by Amy. Uh, Jennifer, roll call, please. Roll call. Oh, yeah. Roll call vote, Phil. Yes. Nevin Smith. Yes. Wiskevitz. Yes. And Parsons. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks night. for sticking. Thank, thank you so much. Okay.